prologue. I considered being nice. I considered making this not a response video, but a standalone video essay without mentioning Hills Alive at all. I considered making it a nice response, wherein I give this creator the benefit of the doubt. But a certain chain of events made me reconsider my stance. The creator going by the name Hills Alive is causing actual damage, spewing actual reactionary rhetoric and holding actual reactionary views, which she then passes on to her impressionable audience. Videos filled with unbashed slavery apologia. Hell's Alive is also a confirmed Zionist who allegedly harassed actress Phoebe Tonkin to the point that she name-dropped her in one of her tweets. That was enough for me to discard all pretense of civility and I will say it straight up. Yikes, Phoenix Ashes, you're right. This ain't it, Chief. Harassing people online, even Z-list celebrities, is definitely not a good look. Now, okay, I know in the past we both said a lot of things that you're going to regret, but I think we can put our differences behind us. Bullying is a very serious issue that I think doesn't get enough recognition, so I'm glad you decided to share this. I have some things I want to share as well. You mentioned someone's Tumblr. I was also on Tumblr very recently and I saw some very disturbing messages. They were posted by a user going by the name of Ozzy Malik. This Ozzy Malik claims to be an A Song of Ice and Fire theorist and House of the Dragon analysis. And Ozzy Malik has spewed some extremely harmful rhetoric. Here's a Tumblr post where they say they hope a young woman kills herself violently and painfully. They even call her a yapping dog. This is not appropriate behavior. I also discovered this Ozzy Malik told a bunch of Harry Potter fans to kill themselves for the simple crime of liking Severus Snape. They also called a girl a whore. If someone calls a woman a yapping dog, they might as well call her the B word because that's what a female dog is. And calling a young woman a whore during an argument is pretty bad. Telling people to kill themselves during an argument is immature at best, despicable at worst. You don't know exactly who you're talking to online. You never know what your words might inspire someone to do. In some places, this behavior is actually illegal. From what I've discovered, this Ozzy Malik person appears to be violently misogynistic because they have attacked and harassed several women like this. Trust me, I did my research. I know. And my audience is about to know as well. Phoenix Ashes, since you decided to call someone out for being a bully online, you inspired me to do the same. Everyone should know what a reprehensible person this Ozzy Malik has been. They also deserve to know who Ozzy Malik is. Because Ozzy Malik also goes by the name Phoenix, which is more than passing strange because your name is also Phoenix. Could it be that Ozzy Malik and Phoenix Ashes are the same person? It's just, if you, Phoenix Ashes, are Ozzy Malik, that means you were on Tumblr bullying people as well. You'd have to be a hypocrite and a liar to call someone out for bullying people online when you were doing the exact same thing. Phoenix Ashes isn't a liar and a hypocrite, are they? This could just be a coincidence, two people named Phoenix analyzing the same series. What are the odds? Except here's another Tumblr post that mentions Ozzy Malik. It also mentions me, Kevin Pendragon. It also says, wait, Ozzy Malik is Phoenix Ashes. I'm afraid you and I have unfinished business. No, no one told me she'd be that strong. It's best we retreat now and regroup. <laughs> Found you. No, impossible! Surprise, bitch. I bet you thought you'd seen the last of me. Hello there. This is another video on toxic, rude, Daenerys Targaryen extremist Phoenix Ashes, or should I call you Ozzy Malik? Or do you pronounce it Ozzy Malik? It's a ridiculous name either way though. Does it come from Watchmen? How fitting. Some time ago, I reacted to a video Phoenix Ashes made where they spent over an hour trashing another A Song of Ice and Fire creator. In that video, they insisted Daenerys Targaryen was not a slave owner, but a slave herself. She had no power, no agency. In my response video, I explained why this was incredibly wrong. A Khaleesi is the equivalent of a queen among the Dothraki. The text makes it clear the Lazarine girls were Danny's slaves. That includes Miri Maz Hold the Dur. The text even tells us that Miri and the other girls specifically belong to Danny. 
When proven wrong, Phoenix Ashes responded as reasonably as you would expect a toxic, rude extremist would respond. They spammed the comment section of my most recent videos. They emailed me demanding a debate. They even insisted they weren't going to stop demanding until I responded to those demands. They messaged me on TikTok of all places. They tagged me in multiple community posts here on YouTube. They also did three videos each, all of them over one hour long reacting to some of my content. A very healthy way of spending one's time. I did to them what they did to someone else, and that was their reaction. You overreacted? Demanding to be on my live stream is definitely an odd choice because I have never live streamed in my life. I expected a video response. One, that would be fair after all. I did not expect this. Now, truly, I don't think Phoenix Ashes believes they overreacted. I think Phoenix Ashes and their audience believe I deserve this. When this is, of course, textbook harassment. Harassment is considered abusive conduct. One person even pointed out to Phoenix Ashes what they were doing was harassment. They responded, call the police then. You don't want to get the Polish police involved in this. I promise you. You won't be surprised to know I'm not the first person Phoenix Ashes has harassed, but you might be surprised by some of the things they have said. There are a couple of Reddit posts talking about their behavior. They seem to have developed a rather notorious reputation on Tumblr. And that's how I learned Phoenix Ashes acting under the name Azamalik on Tumblr has a history of extremely hate-filled behavior. Such as telling someone, and I quote, I hope you kill yourself so violently and painfully that you suffer in excruciating agony for hours. They go on to say, honestly, I'd rather be unhinged and sexy that way instead of existing as a can of spoiled milk with no personality or convictions the way you do. Expressing anger rather than holding it inside is extremely liberating and you should try it too instead of being a little passive aggressive chihuahua. Disappointing. I'd rather be unhinged and sexy. That's an interesting perspective. The law doesn't necessarily agree it's sexy to be unhinged. Inciting others to kill themselves might be illegal depending on where you live. For example, Phoenix Ashes lives in Poland, and in Poland, it is illegal to encourage or assist a suicide. It can land you in prison for three months or up to five years. Yet, here's a community post where they say Kevin Pendragon should be in jail. Sweaty, only one of us is on Beyonce's internet committing crimes, and it ain't me. You brought this on yourself. And this isn't the only time they've done this, mind you. Oh no, I investigated, and while what I initially found wasn't good, it got worse. Timestamps down below for those who are impatient. After they told this girl on Tumblr to kill herself, they called her a yapping chihuahua. They repeat the same yapping chihuahua insult in the comments of their YouTube videos. So, you know this is them. And if there was any doubt, this post confirms it. Hey everyone, gather round. Come watch my video where I call out another creator for being a bully on Tumblr. Don't look into my history though. And it turns out she has to rely on full-blown lies. Well, it turns in, Phoenix Ashes. You're the bully. You're the liar. I'm afraid you're not beating the allegations. But if you try to find these posts on their Tumblr, they're gone, magically disappeared. I wonder why. Could it be telling people to kill themselves is not just illegal, but also not a good look? Perhaps these posts should have stayed in the drafts. They know what they're doing is wrong, but they embrace it. Yeah, I'm awful. So what? Being unhinged is sexy. The problem is, when you don't regulate your behavior, you might end up taking things too far. And clearly... Allison, stay with the king! Hold your ground! Hold your ground! Hold your ground! You've gone too far. I think in the end, Phoenix Ashes realized death threats might be a little too much, so they deleted these messages. It's hard to act like you're morally superior to everyone else if there are screenshots of you telling people to end their own lives over Harry Potter. 
I wondered whether I should include this section at all, because this is a sort of snippet of an old video. And upon consideration, I realized that yes, I should, because this shows the pattern of behavior that I see in all of Hill's lives analysis. Let's talk about your pattern of behavior since you have so much to say about other people. This is the kind of person that was hounding me for a debate. One of the reasons I ignored Phoenix Ashes is because they regularly resort to personal insults, even when unprovoked. There is no chance of having a civil debate with such a person. Frustrate them enough, they'll say anything to try to hurt you. Typically, they'll try and play the victim afterward, which is exactly what happened here. Another reason I ignored them is that they weren't asking me for a debate. They were demanding. My timbers were meant to be shivered. But if you're going to demand I do something, you better have a copy of The Winds of Winter, a truckload of money, or you better be Michael B. Jordan. Elsewise, you and your little toxic attitude can go f yourself. But this video isn't about their three hours worth of videos on me. I did not watch them, and it wasn't out of fear or shame. I don't believe Phoenix Ashes is smart enough to offend me. This is a reaction to a recent video they've done on unreliable narrators. I thought it would be fitting because Phoenix Ashes is a liar and liars are unreliable. When I saw they posted their video with Sansa in the thumbnail, I decided to watch it and see what my ops was up to. Why? Because I'm still a messy bitch that lives for drama after all. Turns out they were not up to much. But when they didn't mention the mistake in the So Speak Martin post, I was very surprised. The Lions Paw, Lions Tooth Business, on the other hand, is intentional. A small touch of the unreliable narrator. I was trying to establish that the memories of my viewpoint characters are not infallible. Sansa is simply remembering it wrong. No! No! Why must you fail me so often? They know this is a mistake because it's the first thing I pointed out in the video I made about them. And I know they watched my video because they reacted to it. You can be mad at me all you want. The fact of the matter is, this So Speak Martin entry has an error in it. Knowing there is an error and not correcting it is lying. So I kept watching to see if they would be dishonest about more things. And they were. Still, I had no intentions of making another video. Phoenix Ash's content is poorly produced and contains a lot of unwarranted hostility. It's a miserable experience listening to them slobber all over their microphone for nothing. Because of the existence of John Connington, who has a specific trauma related to the sound of the bells. Connington, 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 Connington. Oh my God, in the name of quality control, edit your video. What are you doing? Why are you so sloppy? You want to play truth or dare? Here's the truth. You're a sloppy bitch. Yeah, that's right. Phoenix Ashes is disgusting sloppy. They don't know what they're talking about and they lie all the time. I wasn't going to make this video, but then I heard this. This is the argument we have heard before on this channel, in particular during a certain unpleasant incident. If we only see Dolly's unreliable perception of herself, that the truth about her may be different than what she shows us, that we don't know what it's like to experience the nurse's kindness. That's them quoting me. Listen. And it's easy to overlook her mistakes. It's easy to look past the harm she is causing. Because she is a POV character. We are in her head. We see her compassion and empathy from her own point of view. We don't get to see what it's like to be on the receiving end of Daenerys Targaryen's kindness. My reaction video was an unpleasant incident. That's an interesting way of framing the events. Calling it an incident implies that this was something that happened to Phoenix Ashes. When, if we look at a timeline of events, this all began because Phoenix Ashes decided to make a video trashing another creator in the fandom. Because this creator dared to criticize Daenerys Targaryen, Phoenix Ashes decided to attack. And everything changed. And then I reacted to that attack. Not to defend the other creator because I don't know them, but because Phoenix Ashes was wrong many times over. But Phoenix calls their attack and my response an unpleasant incident. And you can practically hear the tears in their eyes. What a mummer's farce. They attacked and they enjoyed doing it, bragging about the views they got in their community post. 
evidence on screen. They even had plans on picking a new target to annoy next. But when you see Phoenix Ashes boasting about their video afterward as if it was fun to do, they lose the moral high ground. It's almost as if claiming there was a creator out there that was damaging the fandom with harmful rhetoric was just a false pretext Phoenix Ashes used to justify their hostile behavior. I considered being nice. I considered making it a nice response. No, Phoenix, stop lying. You weren't going to be nice. You never had plans of being nice. You always knew your video was going to be an attack. All you do is attack others. Trust me, I know. That's very unreliable of Phoenix Ashes, don't you think? They threw the stone, now they're trying to hide their hands. Because when you lash out at another creator and then harass another creator when they call you out on it, you don't get to play the victim. Especially when you were out here telling people to kill themselves. But real people, not just fictional characters in a medieval fantasy story, are often unreliable narrators. So I'd figure me and these old bones should get on here one more time to set the record straight because Phoenix Ashes has told some half-truths and whole lies in their video and in other places as well. And they got a lot of things wrong about Daenerys Targaryen and her story. Don't worry, this isn't just a video on internet beef. As before, you're about to receive a sassy video essay on Danny, and I'm once again going to prove Phoenix Ashes doesn't know how to f***ing read. But I do, in more ways than one. Uh, fair warning, I guess. This video will be very ContraPoints coded. All right, kids. It's trans in time. I watched a lot of her videos while researching and writing this video. Her video on canceling actually proved to be very influential. I think it's also very fitting to have ContraPoints here because Yoshi made an appearance in one of her videos and I love Yoshi. Point of view. You are true scum and Yoshi is gonna beat you to death with a golf club. Hashtag yes, old gamers. That's not how you use Yoshi. <laughs> now, it's time to discuss just how unreliable Danny actually is. Because when you want to invade a country you've never been to so that you can get revenge for a war you don't know the truth of, you're going to be unreliable. Very, very unreliable. We can call this one Daenerys Targaryen and the Unreliable Narrator, a measured response. Also known as Phoenix Ashes is a fraud and a liar. <laughs> Part 1. What is an unreliable narrator? Now you might be asking, what is an unreliable narrator? Just kidding, you're not an idiot, you're not Phoenix Ashes. You already know an unreliable narrator is a narrator whose credibility is compromised. I got that definition from Wikipedia. Research. I am very smart, Nia. With characters that are unreliable narrators, you, the audience, are never quite certain if what they're seeing and saying is the truth or not. What about their world is real and what is fake? Are they deliberately misrepresenting facts? Is there undiagnosed mental illness at work? There are many different factors that can play into the reasons why a character is unreliable. It could simply be because they are human and humans are fallible by nature. Let's touch on that So Spake Martin post. When Arya claims Joffrey's sword is called Lion's Paw, it's just because she misremembered the name. There's no malicious intent in that. It's an honest mistake. It's a minor detail she got wrong. Doesn't matter much. When Phoenix Ashes says Sansa misremembered the name of Joffrey's sword, there is malicious intent in that. They are being dishonest on purpose to attack the credibility of a fictional 13-year-old girl. Now, let's talk about examples of this writing technique outside of A Song of Ice and Fire. For that, we will journey into one of my favorite genres outside of fantasy, which is horror. Let's talk about 2019's Saint Maud. What if I'm getting it all wrong? All the good girls go to hell. Saint Maud is about a troubled young woman named Katie who, after failing to save a patient at her job, as a nurse, dives deep into religion as a way of healing. Now calling herself Maud, she becomes the caretaker of a woman who is terminally ill. The sick woman fears death because of the uncertainty of what comes after. It's also because she's an atheist. 
For her, death is eternal nothingness. Maud believes God has sent her to guide this sick woman and to show her there is eternal glory in his kingdom of heaven. One night, Maud and the sick woman pray together and they both say they can feel the presence of God, a miracle. The sick woman is ecstatic and Maud believes she has fulfilled her purpose. Except later in the movie, the woman reveals she lied. She never felt God's presence at all. She did it to mock Maud and her devotion. He isn't real. You must know that. No, you felt him too, remember? We both did. No, honey, I didn't. That's not true. I hate to be the one to break it to you, but it's just you and me here. Nothing you do matters. It is even revealed the sick woman was actually a demonic entity the entire time. Well, that was easy. <laughs> Take some responsibility for your actions. She attacks Maud, and Maud stabs her to death with a pair of scissors. It is at this point in the movie, Maud knows what she must do. She walks onto a beach dressed in a robe with a bottle of some liquid in hand. A crowd gathers to watch as she pours the liquid on herself, and then she lights a match. Maud doesn't catch on fire though. She becomes radiant. Angel wings sprout from her back. The onlookers fall on their knees in awe. Maud is a vision of God's glory. There's just one thing. Maud was super f***ing mentally ill. There was no demon. She just killed a sick dying atheist for laughing at her. Maud hallucinated the demon because, you see, Maud needed medication, not a miracle. At the very least, she needed therapy. As it turns out, a lot of people need therapy. Nothing was as it seemed in Maud's world. Now, there were major clues about the truth of her reality, but it's easy to go along with her version of events if you're not paying attention. If you accept the film at face value, it's like watching Black Swan, another great psychological horror film, and believing it's about a young woman who is transforming into a giant swan. It's not what the movie's about. In A Song of Ice and Fire, we see things through the point of view of a select cast of characters. We are not given an omniscient view of events. George R. R. Martin tries to write these characters as humanly as possible. They are flawed, each and every one of them. We're also dealing with a wide age range. We have old men like Sir Barristan who I can relate to since I am also extremely old, didn't you know? We also have adults like John Connington, Jamie, and Brienne. Teenagers like Jon Snow and Samuel Tarly, children like Bran and Arya, and one innocent actual baby, Daenerys Targaryen. Ooh woo. We're also dealing with a wide range of intelligence. Samuel is book smart, not street smart. Sansa is extremely naive. Cersei is Cersei, and Victorion is a dumb brute. The Dothraki Sea is not a body of water. You can't sail it. Fucking idiot. And then when you factor in biases and prejudices, things are going to get unreliable real fast. It makes the series worth reading multiple times, just so you can find those special moments of characters being unreliable, picking out the truth when characters are lying to others or themselves, or both, or when they're just wrong because they misremembered something. Like this moment from the So Spig Martin post Phoenix Ashes loved so much they shared it twice. It just bothers me they didn't point out the obvious mistake. People watching their content might walk away thinking it was Sansa that misremembered the event, not Arya. One might think a creator owes their audience honesty. Phoenix Ashes sure thinks so. Because you hate a character in a fantasy show. And that hatred stems from you twisting the text to fit whatever you want it to be. Why lying to your audience is something I will not tolerate. Is Phoenix Ashes not correcting the So Spig Martin entry an example of them lying to their audience? Well, yes. And Phoenix Ashes lies a lot. We know they're not a fan of Sansa Stark. And also it is Sansa who believes herself to be the main character of the story. At the beginning of A Game of Thrones, she's an R-headed idiot. Sansa still blames Arya and is still stupid enough to believe 
that she can trust Cersei because she's a beautiful queen and all beautiful queens in her Dumbass stories are good. So it doesn't benefit Phoenix to point out that Sansa was not the unreliable narrator in this instance. They have an anti-Sansa agenda, which is very strange because they often accuse others of using their platforms to push agendas and propaganda. Every accusation from Phoenix is actually a confession. If Phoenix Ashes points the finger at someone, they are 100% guilty of doing the same thing or worse. And I will prove it. This quote from George R.R. R. Martin himself supports their agenda despite actually being wrong. George is human and therefore unreliable himself, even when it comes to his own series. He got Jane Westerling's hips wrong. Renly's eyes were green in book one, but Baratheon blue in later books. He has to phone a friend when he can't remember certain details of his own story. He's human. He makes mistakes. But when you argue in bad faith, when you debate with ill intent, it's convenient to use his mistakes to push a particular agenda. This is how Phoenix Ashes operates, with ill intent. You cannot trust what they tell you. They are the deceptive kind of unreliable narrator. They knew the information they were sharing was wrong, but they shared it anyway. Part 2. Does Daenerys Targaryen live in the Matrix? Now that we know what an unreliable narrator is, let's talk about one, Daenerys Targaryen. Thanks to this So Spig Martin post, we know that all of Martin's characters are unreliable. That includes Daenerys Targaryen. Daenerys lives separate from everyone else in this story. She's on a completely different continent. It is said by some that it almost feels like she's not part of the overall story. She most certainly is, but because of her remoteness, because for so long she hasn't interacted with any of the main cast of characters, I can understand why someone would feel she is an outlier. But Danny is not an outlier. She is just like everyone else, but with dragons. Sometimes she gets things wrong. Sometimes she lies to others and to herself. That is the core of the unreliable narrator. It's there to make us think about what we read and consider characters' personalities, their motivations and biases before we buy fully into their judgment. Another crucial thing is that an unreliable narrator does not mean that a character is straight up delusional and does not perceive reality correctly at all. Phoenix Ashes is building an argument against the theory that Daenerys Targaryen's POV is so warped that what she sees isn't the reality of the situation. The world around Danny is either much worse off than she is willing to admit to herself, or alternatively, Danny's Targaryen madness has already kicked in and her mental illness is preventing her from seeing the world as it is. What Danny sees isn't actually reality and things are very bad, but no one is pointing it out to her. It's like the folktale, The Emperor's New Clothes. She's naked, but no one is honest enough to say, wear your clothes at. Danny is either willfully deluding herself into thinking everything is fine, or her capital M madness is setting in. She's the dog in a room surrounded by fire telling herself, this is fine. The Saint Maud effect. I don't personally believe in this theory. I'm not even sure how popular this theory actually is. Daenerys does lie to herself on more than one occasion, but this is normal human behavior. She seems to be acutely aware of her situation in Essos. The majority of the time, she knows when she has messed up and she does harbor guilt and remorse over her actions. The problem is she keeps on messing up and she has no intention of stopping. And now she wants to take her mess west. Some people are content with her feeling bad after she's made mistakes, but that doesn't bring the dead back. That doesn't fix the problem. Thoughts and prayers don't actually help anyone, but we will get back to Danny in a moment. We're about to take a strange detour to talk about another character and reveal more of Phoenix Ash's hypocrisy. Part 3. Rhaegar and the Cursed Child Bride Rhaegar is one of the more disliked minor characters in the story, in spite of the text painting a fairly positive picture of him. People tend to buy into Robert's perception of Rhaegar verbatim, even though Ned himself comments that Robert is going too far with his hatred of Targaryens. Once you point out that other characters do not share Robert's view, you know what you can expect. They are unreliable. This is Phoenix coming to the defense of Prince Rhaegar Targaryen. Rhaegar was Danny's brother, whom Phoenix defends because Targaryen. 
Phoenix Ashes points out that Rhaegar is one of the more hated minor characters despite being really popular within the world of the story. They don't seem to realize it doesn't matter how beloved a character is by other characters. Readers have a right to their own opinions on Rhaegar, even if these are opinions Phoenix Ashes doesn't like. But all Phoenix Ashes does is police other people's opinions. It's something of an unhealthy obsession of theirs. Some people don't like Rhaegar because they believe he is a major cause for the civil war that tore the realm apart. They believe running away or kidnapping Lyanna was irresponsible for the crown prince. Just disappearing with the Warden of the North's daughter is random and suspicious. Bed's empty, no note, car gone. You could have died. They did die. <gasps> Rhaegar and Lyanna were gone for months before Rhaegar showed up back at the Red Keep promising to make things better. Now, I have no strong feelings on Rhaegar either way. I am personally waiting to find out what happened before I cast judgment, but I can understand why this might sour him on some readers. Some people also take issue that Rhaegar seemingly abandoned his family to be with Lyanna. Not being there for your family when the realm is on fire is not a good look. Friendly reminder, it's not a good idea to take a second bride while your first one is in mortal peril. Also, some people take issue with the age difference between Rhaegar and Lyanna. Rhaegar was around 25 years old when he and Lyanna either ran away together or he kidnapped her. Lyanna was 16 years old. He was almost 10 years older than her. And that bothers some people. Phoenix Ashes should understand this concern. They take huge issue with the fact that 13-year-old Daenerys married Khal Drogo. Phoenix Ashes even says, Throughout all of A Game of Thrones, Daenerys has virtually no agency whatsoever because she is sold to Drogo as a child bridal slave and she remains that slave up until the moment Drogo dies. Any power she possesses is also being granted to her graciously by her pedophile rapist husband. Now, if Drogo is a p for marrying Danny, Rhaegar is guilty of the same thing for marrying Lyanna. We don't even know exactly how old Drogo is. Danny thinks he's no more than 30 years old, which means he could be 30 or younger. Drogo could very well be 25 years old himself just like Rhaegar was. But here we have Phoenix Ashes coming out in defense of Rhaegar, a man who Phoenix Ashes believes wedded and bedded a girl almost 10 years younger than him. This is also from their Tumblr, by the way. This is where they call Rhaegar and Lyanna a romance. A 25-year-old and a 16-year-old getting married was a romance according to Phoenix Ashes. But strangely, Phoenix takes an absolute moral stance on this issue in every other case. According to them, not even in fantasy fiction is it acceptable for teens to be in relationships with adults because of issues with consent. So I have bad news if you're Team Edward. He's a hundred year old vampire and Bella was just a teen. If you support that, you're a degenerate and you're going to jail. Period. Rhaegar and Lyanna were lovers. Danny and Drogo were illegal. How can one hold these two conflicting opinions? It's easy, by being a f***ing hypocrite. This is the standard of Targaryen stands. Anytime a Targaryen does something, it's good, even if the thing they did was bad when another character did it. Drogo marrying a teenager? Unacceptable. Rhaegar marrying a teenager? Acceptable. I've said in a previous video, Danny and Drogo was written to be viewed as a romance. It's ugly and it has its fair share of problems, but that was Martin's intent. Phoenix Ashes suggested I was a bad person for thinking 14 year olds can consent to relationships with adults in this story as if that's my opinion in the real world. And it seems they're telling their audience this is my real world modern day belief that 14 year olds can consent with adults which is why you get comments like these. And Phoenix sure is smashing the like button on those comments. But I wonder, will their audience say Phoenix shouldn't be around 16 year olds for claiming Liana and Rhaegar was meant to be a love story? No. When it comes to Danny and Drogo, they know the laws and customs in this world are different from our own modern day one. These people just pick and choose when they acknowledge these laws and customs and when they don't. When I tell you Phoenix Ashes knows the rules are different, here is a comment of them saying Drogo and Danny was romanticized by Martin. 
they know it's a romance. If the author of the series is telling you a relationship in this fictional medieval world is meant to be a romance, but you don't like it, then these books are not for you. I would say read something else, but Phoenix Ashes would first have to learn how to read. Calling Martin a creep for setting out to write medieval fiction with realism is incredibly ass backwards because age disparities like Danny and Drogo's and even Rhaegar and Lyanna's were not uncommon in our own real world. These books are aiming for historical accuracy. Acknowledging these things happened isn't an endorsement or an attempt to push for a revival of such relationships. There will be hand waving about Lyanna legally being an adult so it's okay for Rhaegar to marry her and sleep with her, but the same is true of Danny. When a girl has her first period, she's considered old enough to be wedded and bedded. Sansa is considered a woman and she is younger than both Lyanna and Daenerys. Quote, your sister swears she's flowered. If so, she is a woman fit to be wed. You must needs take her maidenhead so no man can say the marriage was not consummated. End quote. The Lannisters in the court of King's Landing expected Sansa to sleep with Tyrion. Her wedding night was a harrowing ordeal for her. Does Phoenix Ashes sympathize with Sansa? No. Sansa, Sansa, Sansa. So much hatred and disdain for Sansa. You'd think that someone that goes on about Danny, the child bride, that Phoenix would also sympathize with Sansa. But they don't. They say they prefer women who rebel against what is imposed on them rather than accepted. Women that challenge gender roles. This is that misogyny I spoke of. If you're a woman, you're not a victim Phoenix cares about unless you fit a certain profile. They even say they don't care about Sansa and what she suffered. But this creates a dilemma. Phoenix gets very upset when they believe people aren't taking Danny and her suffering seriously. When people criticize Danny, Phoenix thinks they're being too harsh. But Phoenix often criticizes Sansa harshly, ignoring her age and her plight. If Phoenix doesn't care about Sansa, why do they expect people to care about Danny? Because they are a hypocrite with no morals and values. I have been rained on and I have been sold. It is not the same. No man wants to be owned. But I guess we only care about certain child brides, right? Danny is a victim. Rhaegar is a good guy. Why? Because they are Targaryens. Meanwhile, Sansa can die in a ditch and Drogo is a PDF file. To me, that sounds like someone twisting the text to fit whatever you want it to be while lying to your audience. More of that sweet hypocrisy I mentioned before. Phoenix Ashes will call Daenerys a child bridal sex slave, Drogo's captive. Meanwhile, Lyanna Stark was in a tower far away from her friends and family, giving birth to a prophecy baby. They don't even consider how the optics of this doesn't look great and why some readers have valid concerns. Ned Stark, her own brother, had to fight his way to get to her bedside before she died. But according to Phoenix Ashes, lots of people in the realm love Rhaegar, so the reader should too. That's not how it works. That's not how any of this works. Anyway, when Daenerys owns slaves and profits from slavery, it is good. When Rhaegar has a child bride, it is good. The Targaryens did nothing wrong. Phoenix Ashes says on their Tumblr, Lyanna ran away from a racist and abuser, meaning Lyanna went with Rhaegar rather than go with Robert Baratheon. Robert Baratheon was not a racist or abuser in his youth. There is nothing in the text to support the idea Robert behaved that way before he was king. He liked to sleep around, it is known, but what Lyanna feared was that Robert would cheat on her. Not that Robert would assault her in any other way. That abusive behavior is something that developed over time, like his weight gain and alcoholism. How did Phoenix Ashes mess that up, I ask you? Oh, I think I know. Because we live in an era where it does not matter what happens in the text, the only thing that matters is what you want it to be. The headcanon industrial complex. But there is a big problem with something called functional illiteracy, which is being able to read but not comprehend what is being read. Part 4. Tumblr. Hey, so, in scripting this video, I've tried to weave in a bit of levity amidst these serious accusations, 
elsewise the video would be rather dour, but I realize that what will be discussed next can't be injected with any level of humor. We will have to get serious for a moment. I want to share the post highlighting Phoenix Ash's harmful and harassing behavior here in one specific section rather than peppered across this long video. I want to lay out the case in one whole narrative. Just know nothing has been doctored, no chat GPT, no Photoshop, no inspect element. Links will be in the description to the offending post. The reason I'm doing this is simple. Phoenix Ashes called out another creator for hateful behavior when they were guilty of the same sort of behavior, if not worse. I was first alerted of their troubling behavior in a comment on the first video I did about Phoenix Ashes. I received a couple of emails as well from people mentioning their hateful behavior and hypocrisy, but nothing containing substantial evidence. Nothing worth making a video on. Since I had no intention of doing a second video, I did not dig deeper at the time. I was silent on my end because I refused to entertain Phoenix Ashes and their tantrum, and I was not about to cave into someone's demands. I also realized I was dealing with a deeply troubled individual. I collected what evidence I could and decided to monitor them from a distance. I knew about their Tumblr account when I made my first video. I discovered it in a Reddit thread while doing research. This is how I knew they identified as white. The Reddit thread was about Phoenix Ash's aggressive behavior. I was able to find a couple of Reddit threads where their behavior was mentioned. Being aggressive online is not a crime depending on what you do, so I chose not to mention their Tumblr or the Reddit threads in my video. I am not actually a messy bitch that lives for drama. That was a joke I will explain later. I wanted my video to be about Daenerys and the topic of slavery, not petty politics or other personal matters. But after being harassed by Phoenix Ashes, I remembered those Reddit posts and I decided to investigate their Tumblr further. I was not the first person they treated like this. I needed to see other examples. The initial post I found contained the aforementioned hostility, but I can find no evidence of threats of violence or anything else unseemly. However, I had the sneaking suspicion if I searched their username with the terms sue or kill yourself, I would find something. When toxic people have a meltdown, these are the typical insults they turn to. As one of Phoenix Ash's victims would say, it's a comeback for people who don't have anything intellectual to say. And I was right. Both kill yourself and suicide led to results. Here's the first post I found where they harass a young lesbian woman. Phoenix Ashes deleted the post on their page, but it remains on the page of the person they said it to. That's the only reason we have evidence. Here's another post where they harass a few Harry Potter fans, telling one of them, don't you have a suicide to commit? Phoenix Ashes deleted this post as well, but because it was screenshotted, we are able to still have evidence. This comment led to a rather lengthy fight where more death threats and insults were tossed out by Aza Malik, aka Phoenix Ashes. One person points out that if they did follow through with the suggestion, Phoenix Ashes would be partly responsible, and rightly so. Again, what Phoenix Ashes did is illegal in their country of Poland. This is the and it got worse part of the video. One of the Harry Potter fans says they are younger than Phoenix Ashes and that their harassment amounts to cyberbullying. Again, this is correct. There's a lot of back and forth, but because Phoenix Ashes has deleted these messages, we can't be exactly sure what they said in response. I reached out to the Harry Potter fan, but they were unable to recover any information regarding the fight. But it's easy to tell the context based on the replies. It would be safe to say none of these replies are good. That's why they were deleted. Phoenix Ashes calls the Harry Potter fan a whore. They make more death threats saying that all Snape and Harry Potter fans should kill themselves. The Harry Potter fan points out that this is a fandom made up of children, which is true. Sure, there are a lot of adults in the HP fandom, but there are also lots of children. It appears Phoenix Ashes starts calling these Harry Potter fans evil for liking Severus Snape. This is nothing new. We've seen them rage at other people like this before. Once again, we have Phoenix Ashes attacking people for having an opinion they did not like. The Harry Potter fan denies sending people to attack Phoenix Ashes on their Tumblr. Phoenix often claims other creators are sending their audience to attack them. They claimed I did this. I've never directed my audience to do anything. 
But here is evidence of Phoenix Ashes ordering their audience to go watch my content and report back because they couldn't since I blocked them. Every accusation is a confession. The only message Phoenix Ashes didn't delete as Ozzy Malik is one that says from the river to the sea, along with several Palestinian flag emojis. From the river to the sea being the call for Palestinian liberation. Now, I did not want to bring race or politics into this, but Phoenix Ashes continually brings race and politics into this. They have a fixation on Palestine in particular. The thing is, this Tumblr fight had nothing to do with Palestine or any other politics at all. What happened here is that Phoenix Ashes discovered one of the Harry Potter fans had a Star of David in their bio, and they decided to make this conversation about something completely different. The person they addressed doesn't even appear to be part of that argument. If you look at the chain of messages, Phoenix Ashes was arguing with a completely different person before posting this Palestinian affirmation. After calling a girl a whore and telling people to kill themselves, Phoenix Ashes deleted all evidence and then tried to cloak themselves and the Palestinian flag in retreat. A quick Google search informed me that the suicide rates on the Gaza Strip, which is located in Palestine, have been on the rise for years now. The people of Palestine truly live in a dystopia, crushed by the oppressive regime of the occupation of Israel. If a person truly cared about these issues, they wouldn't use them in this way. I am trying to avoid moralizing as Phoenix Ashes does in their videos. Again, it was not my intention to bring up politics at all because I feel it is incredibly inappropriate, not to mention wildly off topic. But I cannot fathom the mentality of someone that would do this. The reason I bring this up, the reason this lengthy video exists is because Phoenix Ashes made a video calling out another creator, accusing them of bullying and harassment. They posted a screenshot of this alleged harassment, which directs their viewers to this creator's Tumblr. But come to find out, Phoenix Ashes was doing worse on their own Tumblr and they deleted any message that showed their extremely hateful behavior, acting like it never happened, and then they thought they had the moral high ground to point the finger at someone else. Every accusation is a confession. Phoenix Ashes has to be objectively right at all times. They figured the best way to accomplish this is to find some political issue they can crouch behind, some trump card they can whip out whenever they get into an argument. This is how Snape fans should kill themselves becomes a conversation about Zionism. Make no mistake, Phoenix Ashes does not care about the plight of the people of Palestine. All Phoenix Ashes cares about is being right and their petty online arguments. Phoenix Ashes knew what they were doing when they deleted all those posts. They just thought they could get away with it. You can't even argue that this happened years ago. Forget the past. People change. This happened four months before Phoenix called out another creator. And Phoenix has not changed. Trust me, I know. That's why an apology from Phoenix Ashes could not be accepted as genuine. They are entirely too deceptive. They victimize others, try to hide it, and when they get called out on their reprehensible behavior, they act the victim. In a post on their Tumblr directed at someone criticizing the Targaryens, they wrote, First you deflect, then you avoid, then you hide your head in the sand. You're weak and pathetic as shown with the fact that comments asking you to prove your stance make you have heart palpitations. About time someone makes you realize that what you say online has consequences. The investigation of Hills Alive. The Hills are alive with the sound of gunfire, cause I'm busting caps and someone's about to catch a stray. Phoenix Ashes made their original call out video accusing YouTuber Hills Alive of harassing an actress on Tumblr. Sorry, not sorry to drag you back into this Hills. Just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in. Get over here. 
I'm just still not over the fact that Phoenix Ashes dug up a tweet from 2016 and tried to use it as evidence. They said, look everyone, Hills Alive allegedly harassed someone. This is, this is her Tumblr by the way. She's a bad person. Meanwhile, they were being a bad person on Tumblr. A terrible person, in fact. A criminal, in fact. Let's look at a timeline of events. Phoenix Ashes made their video about Hills Alive and her allegedly bad behavior in January 2023. Phoenix Ashes was telling people to kill themselves four months before calling out Hills Alive. But for the sake of fairness, let's investigate the allegations. Was Hills Alive a terrible person on Tumblr? I'm sorry, Mama Hills, but your daughter might be going to jail. <laughs> To find out if Hills Alive was a terrible person on Tumblr, I had to locate the source of this tweet. Phoebe Tonkin is the actress Hills is said to have offended. So boom, I go to Phoebe's Twitter and find nothing. God damn it. My investigation is already not going well. My next bet is to see what I can find on Tumblr. So bam, I found this post, a collection of tweets that were quoted by Phoebe Tonkin starting in 2014. It's been a decade and we're supposed to be worried about these tweets? Anyway, I found the offending tweet and the Tumblr post it's attached to is kind of mean, kind of snarky, but I'm not seeing evidence of a terrible person. And this isn't even Hill's Tumblr. So that's where I went next to Hill's Alive's Tumblr. I know the name of it since Phoenix Ashes put her name on blast. Here's a post where Hill's talks about the Phoebe Tonkin incident. Uh-oh. I said I was going to be fair, and unfortunately, I have grave news, gentle viewers. After a thorough investigation, I have determined that there was no harassment. Phoenix Ashes just found a crusty, dusty screenshot that seemed to suggest there was some harassment and they tossed it in their video rather than do a modicum of research. They're so sloppy. They slapped allegedly over the top as a way of covering their ass, but they don't talk about it allegedly. They talk about it like it happened. They never get tired of lying or being deceptive. Since Phoenix Ashes is a rotten person that's too lazy to put any work into making their videos, I did the research they should have done since they also don't know how to read. Hills Alive and some pals were on Tumblr talking shit about a TV show they were watching at the time. Phoebe Tonkin was on that show. Hills and pals were critical of her acting. Mind you, this happened over seven goddamn years ago. Phoebe Tonkin, who had just got Tumblr, read some of those posts and got upset. You see, here she is on Twitter saying Tumblr made me cry. That's it. Grand Admiral Phoebe Tonkin googled her name and hurt herself in the confusion. Rachel from the channel Reads with Rachel talks about this. She says writers should not read reviews from the public based on their work. Those reviews are not for them. I feel the same thing applies to actors. Harassment would be Hills Alive going to Phoebe Tonkin with mean messages, which isn't what happened. But that's what Phoenix Ashes does. They go bothering and harassing other people. Every accusation is a confession. Phoenix, you thought you spilled, but this isn't tea. I can't drink this. Take that away. I'm a homosexual. You're trying to feed us lake water. Pass. But Kevin, could there be more bad girls club behavior perpetrated by Hills and her evil cohorts on Tomblor? I don't know. And... I don't care. That was almost a decade ago, and it doesn't seem to represent a pattern of behavior. Seven years ago, Hills Alive and her friends had a burn book on Tumblr. What of it? If Phoenix Ashes can be unhinged and sexy, why can't anyone else be? Telling people to die while we were in the middle of season one of House of the Damn Dragon. In one case, an actress got offended by online criticism. Meanwhile, how many victims does Phoenix Ashes have? What else have they done we don't know about because they scrubbed their bullying from Tumblr like a bloody crime scene? To be honest, I'm side-eyeing Phoebe Tonkin for singling out one regular person on Twitter when they are a celebrity with a platform. Sometimes celebrities do this knowing full well their fans will attack the person being singled out. Did she not have anything else better to do? 
Phoenix Ashes went into Martha Wayne's closet, stole that dead woman's pearls just to clutch them and say, look what Hills Alive has done. They never even stopped to mention the skeletons hiding in their own tumbler closet and then immediately switched to defending Daenerys Targaryen. That was enough for me to discard all pretense of civility and I will say it straight up. Hills Alive has no idea what she's talking about in practically every single one of her video essays, but particularly in her series about Daenerys Targaryen. Hmm. You didn't expect an updated autopsy report, did you, Phoenix? Looks like you have more to learn. You are not a clown. You are the entire circus. Hills being a bad person was just evidence to use that she was wrong about Daenerys. This... This was all about Daenerys and nothing else. That's why Phoenix opens their shitty sloppy video with accusations Hills Alive is a Zionist. She's a bully. She's pro-slavery. She's all the bad things. Don't listen to her. Make no mistake. The only thing Phoenix Ashes cares about is Daenerys Targaryen. They have no politics, no morals, no values. All they have is unbridled rage and Daenerys Targaryen. Talk about the Streisand effect. If you would have just made your videos and left people alone like the rest of us do here on YouTube, none of this would have happened. Now look, when people search Phoenix Ashes, A Song of Ice and Fire, my videos are mixed in with theirs. And my videos showcase your disgusting behavior. I even had someone from a completely different part of my country, the United States of America, send me a screenshot of them searching the same thing. I wanted to test this. Would you look at that? You wanted to be associated with Hills Alive. You never expected to be associated with this. You never expected to become a victim of the sassy man apocalypse. And that must be super fucking hard for you. And I know, what about the allegations of Hills Alive being a Zionist? Hills Alive is a Zionist. Red Team Review, with over 200,000 subscribers, mind you, defends Zionist claims. All Phoenix Ashes does is try to find ways to paint people out to be objectively bad. And Phoenix Ashes learned that pointing the finger and claiming someone is a Zionist is a super effective way of destroying someone's character in an argument. They're like a toddler with a gun, dangerous and dumb. They don't attack arguments, they attack people. Phoenix Ashes shared a post where someone makes points about the existence of Israel and a two-state solution, but if the tweet they shared was old, then how old is this post? It looks very old, and is it even from Hills? Where did it even come from? Let's not forget, this is coming from Phoenix Ashes. I do not trust them or any evidence they present to back up their claims. They are a liar and a fucking snake. Now, this might be controversial, but having a political opinion on a matter, Israel's right to exist, for example, doesn't automatically make someone a bad person. There are some people I disagree with on political matters, but I would be willing to sit across from them and have a debate with them in the free marketplace of ideas because some people can be reasoned with, some people can be converted, some people can become allies. And in the battles to come, sweaty, we are going to need allies. More importantly, we need allies. It's not wise to treat everyone like an enemy that must needs be destroyed. That's what Phoenix Ashes does because they don't care about causes. They are a self-proclaimed extremist. They just care about winning online arguments. All they want to do is destroy people they perceive to be the enemy. So whoever made this Tumblr post, Whoever that person may be, it might be possible to convince that person the occupation of Israel needs to end, or it might not. This is just one post that lacks a lot of context. Maybe this person is open to new ideas, or maybe not. Because not everyone can be reasoned with. Some people believe things that are too harmful and hateful, and it would be a waste of time trying to talk sense to them. You don't need to debate such people. You only need to defeat such people. Like when the gays banded together to defeat hate-filled, homophobic orange juice peddler, Anita Bryant. Someone even dared to serve her a banana cream pie right to her face. And uh, um, all kinds of problems. And uh, uh, every... Oh, oh, oh. Security agents, security agents. No, no, let, let him stay. No. Let him stay. Well, at let least stay. it's a fruit pie. Anita needed to be defeated, not debated. 
Phoenix Ashes, your order is up. Order up, Squidward! You wanna eat it? Eat it to yourself, you shit twisted fuck! Part 6, Daenerys Targaryen and the Unreliable Narrator. Now let's get back to discussing the books. The evidence Phoenix Ashes provides that there are people in the fandom that foolishly believe Daenerys Targaryen has an altered view on reality comes from a Reddit post from nine years ago. Phoenix Ashes is arguing with a nine-year-old Reddit thread. Hey, what are you trying to push on us? What the hell? Why would anyone in their right mind do this? Why the hell do they keep digging up old shit and getting mad about it? A tweet from seven years ago, a post from nine years ago. Phoenix Ashes, go outside. You would think if this was so important, they would have a more recent reference to rage at. It's been nine bloody damn years. If this was a popular theory worth debunking, surely there would have been YouTube videos or other essays about it. This is a complete non-issue, but Phoenix Ashes acts like it's tearing apart the fabric of the fandom. Unreliable narrator argument is very often used against the Daenerys Targaryen. Even though her very first chapters show that, even at the ripe old age of 13, she is exceptionally observant. They are your people, and they love you well. Magister Illyrio said amiably, in hold fasts all across the realm, men lift sacred toes to your health, while women sew dragon banners and hide them against the day of your return from across the water. He gave a massive shrug. Or so my agents tell me. And he had no agents, no way of knowing what anyone was doing or thinking across the narrow sea. But she mistrusted Illyrio's sweet words, as she mistrusted everything about Illyrio. Her brother was nodding eagerly, however. In fact, when asked about who is the most unreliable narrator, more than 700 people agreed that it's her, and it seems to be the most avoided answer as well. Phoenix has this odd obsession with numbers. They're always watching other people and measuring their metrics, their upvotes, their subscriber counts. They have this constant concern the masses are wrong and it's their job to set them right. They can't seem to grasp there are other people with opinions that differ from their own. Might I suggest a strong dose of Mind your own f***ing business. With mind your own f***ing business, you'll be able to grow the f*** up and act like a decent f***ing human being. Now before we get to how other characters perceive Daenerys, I want to point out something Phoenix Ashes just blundered through. We have our first instance of Danny being unreliable that we must needs discuss. Phoenix uses this paragraph from book one, Danny's first chapter, as an example of her being exceptionally observant. Danny mistrusts Illyrio, and rightfully so, if only she extended that mistrust to the matronly women she will meet in the future. Anyway, Danny doesn't know if Illyrio truly has agents in Westeros reporting back about secret toast and dragon banners. However, just a couple of chapters later, when she and Ser Jorah are discussing whether or not Viserys would make a good king, she says this, quote, Danny rode close beside him. Still, she said, the common people are waiting for him. Magister Illyrio says they are sowing dragon banners and praying for Viserys to return from across the narrow sea to free them. The common people pray for rain, healthy children, and a summer that never ends, Ser Jorah told her. It is no matter to them if the High Lords play their Game of Thrones, so long as they are left in peace. He gave a shrug. They never are. Danny rode quietly for a time, working his words like a puzzle box. It went against everything that Viserys had ever told her to think the people could care so little whether a true king or a usurper reigned over them. Yet the more she thought on Jorah's words, the more they rang of the truth. End quote. The common people are never left alone, Sir Jorah says to Daenerys. The High Lords are always including them in their wars. A Winds of Winter sample chapter tells us, And everywhere the dragons danced, the people died. Danny mistrusts Illyrio. She believes him unreliable, yet she's repeating his words back as the truth all the same, which makes her unreliable. It's a good thing then that she's open to Sojora correcting her. Sadly, the lesson does not stick with her, because in a clash of kings, Daenerys and Jorah have a disagreement over what her next move should be once she leaves Karth. She considers going back to Pentos, and Ser Jorah has to remind her that Illyrio Malpatis is not a true ally of hers. Quote, House Targaryen has friends in the free cities, she reminded him. Truer friends than Zaro or the Pureborn. If you mean Illyrio Malpatis, I wonder. For sufficient gold, Illyrio would sell you as quickly as he would a slave. 
My brother and I were guests in Illyrio's manse for half a year. If he meant to sell us, he could have. He did sell you, Sir Jorah said, to Khal Drogo. Danny flushed. He had the truth of it, but she did not like the sharpness with which he put it. Illyrio protected us from the usurper's knives, and he believed in my brother's cause. Illyrio believes in no cause but Illyrio. Gluttons are greedy men as a rule, and magisters are devious. Illyrio Mopatis is both. What do you truly know of him? End quote. Danny knows Sir Jorah is right. We know she knows Illyrio isn't trustworthy because she came to that conclusion herself in the first book in her first chapter. When she and Viserys are talking about Illyrio's motives, Danny wonders what Illyrio wants. Viserys tells her, quote, The Magister knows that I will not forget my friends when I come into my throne. Danny said nothing. Magister Illyrio was a dealer in spices, gemstones, dragon bone, and other less savory things. He had friends in all of the nine free cities, it was said, and even beyond in Vase Dothrak and the fabled lands beside the Jade Sea. It was also said that he never had a friend he wouldn't cheerfully sell for the right price. Danny listened to the talk in the streets, and she heard things. End quote. Given the right monetary motivation, he'd sell Danny like he'd sell out any of his other friends. This does not mean he would sell Danny into slavery. There are other ways of selling people. Let's say he decided to sell one of the friends he has in the fabled lands beside the Jade Sea. Does that mean the friend was sold into slavery? No. If that friend had an enemy, and that enemy went to Illyrio with an offer of lots of money for information, Illyrio might be tempted to sell out his friend. If Danny goes back to Pentos and Illyrio sells her out to the Lannisters, would he be selling her into slavery? No, nar. Phoenix says this passage is proof that Danny was literally sold as a slave, but Phoenix can't read. Danny argues with Sir Jorah simply because she did not like the sharpness of his words, the stubborn stormborn. Danny is being unreliable in this moment. We the reader know, just like Danny knows, Illyrio is not meant to be trusted. But Danny is now arguing he is a friend of House Targaryen, something Viserys once said and she secretly disagreed with. So Danny is arguing just to argue. Daenerys also forgets what Jorah told her about the common people of Westeros and their opinions on who sits the Iron Throne. Quote, I am their rightful queen, Danny protested. You are a stranger who means to land on their shores with an army of outlanders who cannot even speak the common tongue. The lords of Westeros do not know you and have every reason to fear you. You must win them over before you sail. A few at least. End quote. So Jorah says the lords of Westeros do not know her and have every reason to fear and mistrust her. This all sounds so very familiar. I don't have love here. I only have fear. But let's move on. Daenerys is arguing things we know are not true. Things she knows are not true. This is Daenerys being an unreliable narrator. How did Phoenix Ashes miss that? Functional illiteracy. Now, in this stage of the video, Phoenix Ashes will talk about characters and their interpretation of Daenerys. That there is Barristan POV in her proximity. But it's immediately dismissed because Barristan only gets a POV when she is already gone. But that does not change anything. He has been with her for months at this point and does not make any observation that would contradict Danny's views. Phoenix just said Sir Barristan Selmy, Lord Commander of the King's Guard, doesn't challenge Danny's views. Phoenix Ashes, you have the books. I know you have the books. I'm not going to claim you haven't read them like you and your audience claim I have it. But for you to choose to read them like this. Barristan challenges Danny's views on more than one occasion. I would argue that is part of his purpose as a character. He knows more about her family than anyone else. In book three, in Danny's first chapter, she and her crew are on a boat sailing back to Pentos. Back then, Barristan was disguised as Arston Whitebeard. His goal was to get close to Danny and observe her to see if she had the taint of madness or not. While on the boat, Danny, Arston, and Jorah talk about Westeros and Rhaegar. It is then Arston challenges some of Danny's views. Quote, Did you ever meet my royal father? 
King Aerys II had died before his daughter was born. I had that honor, your grace. Did you find him good and gentle? Whitebeard did his best to hide his feelings, but they were there, plain on his face. His grace was often pleasant. Often, Danny smiled, but not always. He could be very harsh to those he thought his enemies. A wise man never makes an enemy of a king, said Danny. Did you know my brother Rhaegar as well? End quote. A wise man never makes an enemy of a king. True, perhaps it is not wise to make an enemy of someone who wields incredible amounts of power. But sometimes you have to. Sometimes it's a necessity. Daenerys makes it sound like if a person makes themselves the enemy of a king, that person must have done something wrong to end up in that position. Robert Baratheon and Eddard Stark were enemies of King Aerys and they didn't do anything but exist. Here we come to the matters where Daenerys can be considered to be the most unreliable. The matters concerning her own family. Does Phoenix Ashes talk about this in their video? Nope. The majority of what Daenerys knows about House Targaryen and its downfall comes from her brother, Prince Viserys. Viserys was an unreliable narrator. As a Targaryen himself, he was heavily biased in favor of his own house. Not only that, he was a child during the war that led to its fall, and Sir Barristan explains Queen Rhaella sheltered him as much as she could from the events as they unfolded. No doubt this included King Aerys' descent into madness. We can be sure of this because when Sir Barristan mentions to Danny that her father was once known as the Mad King, she denies it. Quote, the old man did not blink. Your father is called the Mad King in Westeros. Has no one ever told you? Viserys did, the Mad King. The Usurper called him that, the Usurper and his dogs, the Mad King. It was a lie. Why ask for truth, Sir Barristan said softly, if you close your ears to it. End quote. Let's talk about the Usurper and his dogs. The Usurper being Robert Baratheon, his dogs being Eddard Stark, Tywin Lannister, and Jaime Lannister, the Kingslayer. Daenerys considers Robert's rebellion as being illegitimate. Robert was not a true king in her opinion, though all she learned about him, she learned from Viserys. Does Phoenix Ashes mention this in their video? No. We know that though the war was called Robert's Rebellion, it was initially Jon Arryn that called his banners in defiance of the Mad King's orders. Robert was just the figurehead. He had a Targaryen relative, so he had the best claim out of the rebels. You have to have the right person to lead a revolution. Some people don't get that. The war was the culmination of a series of unfortunate events. Rhaegar and Lyanna ran off together, or he kidnapped her, whatever. Lyanna's brother, Brandon, rode down to King's Landing with a couple of friends and did the rational thing by telling the mad King's son, Rhaegar, to come out and die. Why would he do that? Was he dumb? Well, yes. The Mad King went full jigsaw and decided he wanted to play a game of Thrones. He put Brandon in a trap and Lord Rickard over a wildfire bonfire. Once they were dead as hell, the Mad King then ordered John Aaron to turn over Ned and Robert so they could be executed too. Daenerys doesn't know any of this. She believes that Rhaegar and Lyanna ran away together and that they were in love. Which is fair. She knows just about as much as we do, and most readers think it was a consensual relationship. But Robert and Eddard did nothing to warrant their death threats. That's one of the bad things about Danny, her bloodlust for the usurper and his dogs. She doesn't know Ned and Robert were literally fighting for their lives. She doesn't know about Jamie and the wildfire plot. Tywin's treatment of her family, Elia, baby Aegon, and baby Rhaenys was horrific. Tywin should have been brought to justice before his death, but what Daenerys wants is not justice, it's vengeance. She says as much to Zaro Zohandaxos when she is in Karth in Book 2. Quote, I mean to sail to Westeros and drink the wine of vengeance from the skull of the usurper. She scratched Rhaegal under one eye, and his jade green wings unfolded for a moment, stirring the air in the palanquin. A single perfect tear ran down the cheek of Zaro Zohandaxos. Will nothing turn you from this madness? End quote. Will nothing turn you from this madness? And everywhere the dragons danced, the people died. What could it possibly mean? In this series, there's a difference between vengeance and justice. Vengeance is personal and petty and can lead to a deadly dangerous cycle. 
Ilaria San has a wonderful speech about it in Book 5. Instead of that, the show gave us this. And weak men will never rule Dorn again. God damn it! Justice is impartial. It is proportionate to the crime committed. It is not based on emotion. It has nothing to do with what a person deserves because... I don't deserve this. To die like this. I was building the house. Deserves got nothing to do with it. Justice does not always provide a sense of satisfaction. Vengeance is all about personal satisfaction. I went on what the movie advertisements refer to as a roaring rampage of revenge. I roared, and I rampaged, and I got bloody satisfaction. It makes one feel good in the moment, but like the hours before bottoming, that feeling is fleeting. Bro, what did you just say? I, I just- It's a theme the reader is made aware of in the first book, when Sir Loris expects Ned Stark to send him to hunt down the mountain, but Ned has to deny him. Sir Loris was still super salty about the time the mountain almost killed him when, who cares, get over it. Ned says, quote, no one doubts your valor, Sir Loris, but we are about justice here and what you seek is vengeance, end quote. Justice, not vengeance. It's a theme for those paying attention and some people aren't paying attention. I'm gonna be real with you. I don't give a single flying fuck as to whether some people in the 163 were just innocent slavers. They got what they deserve because, I don't know, they own human beings as property. And while you make all sorts of convoluted arguments as to them not being personally responsible for the crucifixion of children, are you seriously thinking that otherwise all of them were kind benevolent masters? We got the samples of the slave masters of Astapor and Yunkai and how they treat their slaves on an average day, and for that alone they deserved punishment and suffering. They still profited immensely from slavery, no matter in how many pretzels you twist yourself. How did Phoenix Ashes miss that, I ask you? Functional illiteracy. Getting your rocks off because you killed a bunch of slavers is not, in fact, justice. Lord Rickard Karstark's whole thing was that he wanted to get revenge on House Lannister because Jaime Lannister, I don't know, he misplaced his sword into the head of one of Karstark's sons. It's a mistake that can happen to anyone. And then what happened to Rickard Karstark after he got vengeance on some innocent squires? He is now dead. Well, at least now he's with his sons. The whole point is that vengeance is a negative. So wanting to drink from a dead man's skull is not a great goal to aspire to, Danny. It's not a good look, Gorge. Phoenix Ashes encourages this kind of eye for an eye behavior in Danny's storyline because they don't know how to read. Daenerys wants vengeance, not justice, against Robert and Ned. She wants to kill Jaime too, but Jaime killed her father in part because he wanted to save the city. Still, he never told anyone about the wildfire. And he failed to protect Rhaenys and Aegon, which was literally his... You had one job, Jaime. Jaime has a lot of atoning to do, so we will leave it to Robert and Ned as being innocent. And by that I mean Robert was innocent when the Mad King tried to kill him. Danny wanted to kill Robert after he sends an assassin to kill her and her unborn son, makes sense. Wanting to kill Ned never makes any bloody damn sense because he never did anything to her. He cut ties with Robert after he saw the bodies of Elia and her children and Robert did nothing but call them dragon spawn. If R plus L equals J is true, Ned is now raising Rhaegar's son as his own, protecting him from the wrath of Robert. Ned spoke out in defense of Daenerys on more than one occasion, and yet Daenerys still harbored ill feelings for him as far as Book 5, when Ned Stark is already a pile of bones. Oh, Cindy! This is a skeleton! This is bones! Quote, Stark was a traitor who met a traitor's end. Your grace, said Selmy, Eddard Stark played a part in your father's fall, but he bore you no ill will. When the eunuch Varys told us that you were with child, Robert wanted you killed, but Lord Stark spoke against it. Rather than countenance the murder of children, he told Robert to find himself another hand. Have you forgotten Princess Rhaenys and Prince Aegon? Never. That was Lannister work, your grace. Lannister or Stark? What's the difference? Viserys used to call them the usurper's dogs. If a child is set upon by a pack of hounds, does it matter which one tears out his throat? All the dogs are just as guilty. The guilt 
The word caught in her throat. Hosea, she thought. And suddenly she heard herself say, I have to see the pit. In a voice as small as a child's whisper. Take me down, sir, if you would. A flicker of disapproval crossed the old man's face, but it was not his way to question his queen. As you command. End quote. Daenerys hesitates after she says this because she recalls one of her dragons killed an innocent child. In response, she tried to imprison all three of them in one great pit, except the guilty one got away. She judged them all guilty for the actions of one. This is how Danny operates, by using collective punishment. Someone did a bad thing, now everybody getting punished. The Marine the slaves turned on the masters and liberated the city themselves the moment I arrived. Anyone who resists Cersei will see his family butchered. Can't expect them to be heroes. They're hostages. They are. In a tyrant's grip. Whose fault is that? Mine. What does it matter whose fault it is? Thousands of children will die if the city burns. What could it mean? But like most of Danny's decisions, it works for the time being, but it will not serve long term. It also doesn't address the problem. It does nothing to address the guilty party. I get that Danny locked up Viserion and Rhaegal out of fear they would kill as well. I understand why she did what she did, but Drogon was the guilty party. He killed the little girl, and he got away. This is a trend with Daenerys. She never actually gets the guilty party. Her targeting Ned Stark, even after he's dead as hell, is part of that trend. He is an innocent man. Also, if you want to know how Danny can seek to harm innocent people, there's your answer. She only has to believe it's the right thing to do. If the person is not innocent based on what she knows. Sir Barristan tried to tell Daenerys the truth about her family. She even recognizes that he has so much knowledge about House Targaryen that she and Viserys never had. But she puts him off. Quote, Your father always had a little madness in him, I now believe. Yet he was charming and generous as well. So his lapses were forgiven. His reign began with such promise. But as the years pass... The lapses grew more frequent until Danny stopped him. Do I want to hear this now? Sir Barristan considered a moment. Perhaps not. Not now. End quote. Perhaps not now. That was in book three. As of book five, Sir Barristan and Daenerys have not had the talk about House Targaryen and they probably never will. There are too many POV characters in Marine right now, and if I were a betting man, I would put money down, Barristan is going to die. I think Danny will learn about her family from Tyrion. We know Tyrion's mouth and his harsh take on reality. There's another Targaryen that learned about the imp's mouth in Book 5. Quote, Aegon's mouth twisted in fury. I will not come to my aunt, a beggar. I will come to her, a kinsman, with an army. A small army. There. That's made him good and angry. The dwarf could not help but think of Joffrey. I have a gift for angering princes. End quote. He has a gift for angering queens as well. Let Tyrion be the one to tell Danny the harsh truth of House Targaryen. She will regret not learning from Barristan. Imagine Danny pushing back on the idea her father was not mad. Imagine Danny trying to convince Tyrion she can end slavery in one lifetime. What do you think Tyrion is going to do? <laughs> Phoenix Ashes does not talk about Danny putting off Barristan or anything else, but they were sure to mention Sansa misremembering Joffrey's sword for a second time. It's astounding, really. Daenerys Targaryen wants to start a war in Westeros based on information she received from her brother who was raised sheltered from the truth about the fall of House Targaryen and who was also tainted by madness. Phoenix makes it seem like Sansa Stark's upcoming unreliable moment is going to be huge when the most prominent theory is that Sansa might kill her cousin, a child. Like, who even cares? Okay, it's a bad thing to kill younglings, I know. But Daenerys wants to invade a country because she doesn't know her father was actually insane and some innocent men disposed him rather than die. Daenerys' war would lead to the deaths of many innocents. If the War of Five Kings was horrible and it didn't have dragons, what is going to happen when Danny invades with dragons? It's a theme that when the High Lords play their Game of Thrones, the innocents are the ones that suffer the most. There's even a line from the Winds of Winter that reinforces this theme. And everywhere the dragons danced, the people died. But what could it mean? 
Sir Barristan was honest with Danny. He tells her he lied to her about his identity in order to see if she too was tainted by madness. This offends her, which honestly, same. I would be offended too if some old man lied to me just so he could see my taint. I Nevertheless, Barristan's actions were reasonable, no matter how much they offended Danny. He had to observe her and pretend as if he did not know her to get the measure of the person she was. He determines she has no taint as he observed in Aeris or Viserys. But madness does not always present itself as cold cruelty and callousness. Sometimes madness masks itself as greatness. They are two sides of the same coin, after all. You won't know which side the coin will fall on until it lands. One mad act can settle the matter for all. Overstating Sansa's unreliability while downplaying Daenerys's is quite strange. Martin said all of his POV characters are unreliable, but Phoenix Ashes spends the whole video not addressing Daenerys's moments of unreliability. How did they do that? Functional illiteracy. The major theory about Sansa and her misremembering things is that perhaps one day she will forget how much medication Sweet Robin has been given and that she will cause him to have a fatal overdose. One of his maesters told Sansa, excuse me, Elaine, that the medication Sweet Robin is taking, Sweet Sleep, never leaves the flesh. And it sounds like if enough builds up in a person's system, then they die. Quote, it was too soon, my lady. You do not understand. As I've told the Lord Protector, a pinch of sweet sleep will prevent the shaking, but it does not leave the flesh and in time, end quote. This is the death of a child. Tragic, but not an event to shake the realm. I am fully prepared to judge Elaine slash Sansa harshly for this because killing an innocent child is a bad thing. I'm already side eyeing her because a lot of her recent thoughts sound very Cersei like in my opinion. Like in the winds of winter when Sweet Robin is talking to Elaine about rumors he heard from a knight. Quote, the Lord of the Eyrie can do as he likes. Can't I still love you even if I have to marry her? Sir Harold has a common woman. Benjakot says she's carrying his bastard. Benjakot should learn to keep his fool's mouth shut. Is that what you would have from me? A bastard? She pulled her fingers from his grasp. Would you dishonor me that way? End quote. There's another quote where she thinks about slapping and spanking Sweet Robin, which doesn't sit right with me. The thing about Sansa learning about the Game of Thrones from people like Littlefinger and Cersei is that she learned the Game of Thrones from people like Littlefinger and Cersei, and that might not be a good look. We have to hold on to the hope that Elaine remembers that courtesy is a lady's armor and that a lady doesn't kill children with overdoses. Her skin has turned from ivory to porcelain to fentanyl. My fear is that Elaine will rectify Sweet Robin's death by telling herself it wasn't Sansa that killed a child, it was Elaine. True born women don't murder, bastards do. She's going to rinse her hair, rinse her hands, and move on. Anyway, Phoenix Ashes is making a huge case about how Barristan is proof against the idea that Danny's view of the world is largely alternative to the actual reality of her situation. The idea he doesn't challenge her views is wrong. Barristan does do this on multiple occasions. To not mention Danny's views on Robert's rebellion in a video on her unreliability is incredibly dishonest. It's practically lying by omission. Because you hate a character in a fantasy show. And that hatred stems from you twisting the text to fit whatever you want it to be, while lying to your audience is something I will not tolerate. Every accusation is a confession. I understand why Hills Alive took the high ground and didn't do a video response, but it would have been a boss ass move if she just made one video asking one question. And? Because Phoenix Ashes said, something I will not tolerate. And dot, 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 question mark. What are you going to do about it? Barristan's opinion about Daenerys isn't wholly positive. He thinks she should have gone with Quentin and made for Dorne. Yes, he is biased because he wants to go home, but he is also of the opinion Daenerys does not belong in Essos. She does not fit in Marine as queen. That is not her place. He believes Danny is a young girl given to strong passions, which is why Dario got her attention and Quentin did not. He calls Quentin mud, saying, quote, 
You could make a poultice out of mud to cool a fever. You could plant seeds in mud and grow a crop to feed your children. Mud would nourish you where fire would only consume you. But fools and children and young girls would choose fire every time. End quote. Young girls would choose fire every time. I wonder. This quote about mud, it's giving, why do girls choose assholes and not nice guys? Daenerys' whole cause in Westeros is based on reclaiming the Iron Throne because she believes a great injustice was done to her family. She wants to take down the usurper. Robert was a bad king, but Danny did not know that. Robert was villainized and Rhaegar romanticized in all the stories she was told by her brother Viserys. This is incredibly important in discussing Daenerys' unreliability. Does Phoenix Ashes discuss this? No. Of course not. Daenerys, Quentin, who throughout his journey heard terrible things about her from the unreliable slaver POV. Starts low-key believing in it, but ends up meeting her and changing his opinion drastically. Oh, Quentin is mentioned. But it's also dismissed because the meeting itself is from her POV and that he thinks of her positively later is also somehow rendered null and void. And we also see how Friedman talk about her. But that's also apparently null and void. Phoenix Ashes would have you believe Quentin is worried about Daenerys because of everything he heard of from the slavers. But Quentin is Westerosi. Quentin grew up hearing about the Targaryens and their madness in Westeros. It's in the second paragraph. It's right there on screen. Oh my God. How are you this bad? Functional illiteracy. Phoenix thinks counting all the people that like Daenerys is a point in her favor. As if this is a popularity contest, as if the majority of characters liking Daenerys means she is objectively good. Hey, look at this community post by Phoenix Ashes. Red Team Review has 200,000 subscribers. That's good. I like them. Haunter is my favorite Pokemon. Anyway, Red Team Review did something on Twitter Phoenix Ashes didn't approve of. Phoenix Ashes going off because someone did something they declared to be morally bad? Well, imagine my shock. Imagine my shock. Imagine my shock. Well, in But look, Phoenix Ashes is saying Red Team Review, despite having over 200,000 subscribers, is wrong. So Phoenix, you agree. Someone can have a lot of supporters and still be wrong. If that's the case, why are you trying to prove Danny has a lot of supporters? The numbers don't matter, right? Always watching other creators and counting their metrics, policing opinions with this sense of moral superiority. Phoenix Ashes wouldn't be so worried about what other people did with their lives if they had one of their own. Daenerys has a likable personality. She's also extremely beautiful. Of course, Quentin would have a positive opinion on her. He was sent to wet her and he expected her to be like her father. But this isn't about Danny's personality. Opinions differ on Danny, not because of her personality, but because of the things she's done. For example, you see the passage Phoenix is using as evidence to support the idea of Good Queen Danny, the most popular girl at Westeros High School? Well, it's part of a larger passage where Quentin is thinking back on his meeting with Danny, but also thinking back on his brief time in Astapor. I'll read it for you. Unlike certain other YouTubers, I do in fact know how to read. Quote, it runs in the blood. King Aerys II had been mad. All of Westeros knew that. He had exiled two of his hands and burned a third. If Daenerys is as murderous as her father, must I still marry her? Prince Doran had never spoken of that possibility. Frog would be glad to put Astapor behind him. The Red City was the closest thing to hell he had ever hoped to know. The young Kai'i had sealed the broken gates to keep the dead and dying inside the city. But the sights he had seen riding down those red brick streets would haunt Quentin Martell forever. A river choked with corpses, the priestess in her torn robes, impaled upon a stake and attended by a cloud of glistening green flies. Dying men staggering through the streets, bloody and befouled, children fighting over half-cooked puppies. The last free king of Astapor screaming naked in the pit as he was set upon by a score of starving dogs. And fires, fires everywhere. He could close his eyes and see them still. Flames whirling from brick pyramids larger than any castle he had ever seen. Plumes of greasy smoke coiling upward like great black snakes. End quote. Daenerys is directly responsible for Astapor. She killed many of the slave masters when she claimed the Unsullied. She removed the surviving slave masters from power. 
Is this me sympathizing with the slavers? No, obviously. I have to point that out though, so that when Phoenix Ashes makes their inevitable response video, they don't say, there is a YouTuber by the name of Kevin Pendragon, who in a video said that Daenerys Targaryen executed many slave masters in Astapor. This is clearly slave apologia. He is defending slavery. Need I remind you all, Danny is a 14 year old inbred with no formal education who grew up on the streets. She grew up in poverty. Have you considered her lack of a proper nutritional diet growing up is perhaps why she makes mistakes now? No, you just accuse her of killing slavers and twisting pretzels into yourself. I'm merely describing what Danny did, but it seems when you talk about something Danny did without constantly bringing up her age and her inexperience and dozens of excuses, people get mad. Anyway, Daenerys appointed a council of her own choosing to rule the city. When she left, a former slave named Cleon proclaimed himself king and disposed of said council. Cleon claimed they were working with the former masters to put them back into power. Cleon exposed this conspiracy to the people of Astapor. He then hacked off their heads and claimed the crown. We learn this from one of his supporters, a man calling himself Lord Gale, when he presents himself at Danny's court in Marine. We cannot know if this is true or not. It's believable the slave masters would try to scheme their way back into power, but it's also believable that Cleon saw a chance to seize power for himself, and he spread lies about the council in an effort to seize that power. Danny did create a veritable feast for crows in Astapor. In this instance, Lord Gale is an unreliable narrator. The city collapses under Cleon's rule. There is infighting between the various factions in the city. People are starving. Children are still being mutilated. Danny hears of this from a trading captain as she sits in her pyramid in Marine. Quote, the master of the Indigo Star was Carthine, so he wept copiously when asked about Astapor. The city bleeds. Dead men rot unburied in the streets. Each pyramid is an armed camp, and the markets have neither food nor slaves for sale. And the poor children, King Cleaver's thugs, have seized every high-born boy in Astapor to make new unsullied for the trade, though it will be years before they are trained. End quote. This comes in the same chapter as Lord Gale's introduction. He didn't report this when he spoke to Daenerys. That would make the king look bad. Why would Danny choose to marry the king of a dying city? Again, Lord Gale is an unreliable narrator. Every character is. It's important to detail the tragedy of Astapor as it stands in book three, because all of the horror happening there is before Yunkai and their sellswords attack the city. We can't blame the slavers for ruining the peace and harmony Danny gave Astapor because she never did bring peace and harmony. All the starvation and infighting is all because Danny failed to anticipate what might happen to the city after she sacked it and left. Danny failed to provide a long term solution for the people of Astapor. She makes mistakes, she's learning, leave her alone is not a great excuse. Essos is not a sandbox, it's not a tutorial, a place for Danny to learn how to be queen before she hex off to Westeros. It's not a place where she can level up because people are dying, lots of people, and it's not the slaver's fault, it's not the bad guys, it's her fault. And she's young is not a good excuse, that's just infantilizing her. She's not a baby. When your decisions cause a city to decline to such a state where a new disease forms and spreads, friendly reminder, don't be one of the reasons why a pandemic starts and spreads. It's definitely not a good look, Gorge. Which brings us back to Quentin. Quentin described the city as hell with his opinion of Daenerys' change if he knew she was responsible for creating that hell on earth. What if Quentin knew she lied to him? Quote, the Dornish prince had gone white as milk. I, I had heard there were three. Drogon is hunting. He did not need to hear the rest. End quote. 
It's an understandable lie. To explain Drogon's absence would necessitate explaining Hosea's death and why the dragons are in the pit to begin with, but it's still a lie. If anyone asked Quentin, he would tell them what Danny told him. Drogon is hunting, not Drogon is missing, not Drogon killed an innocent child and escaped capture. Quentin doesn't know one of the dragons killed a child. Would his opinion of Daenerys change if he knew that? Regardless of the severity of the lie, this is Danny being unreliable. Does Phoenix Ashes mention this in their video? No. Nope. People say that they can't wait for Tyrion to interact with Danny and see her. But I'm more than sure that if that happens and he has any positive opinion on her, he too will be deemed an unreliable narrator. Tyrion Lannister has been described as a villain by George R. R. Martin. One of Tyrion's goals in Book 5 is to kill Jaime and rape and kill Cersei. Phoenix Ashes doesn't care about the quality of the people supporting Danny, just the numbers. Remember how Tyrion treated Illyrio's slave? Remember how he treated that slave girl in Volantis? Phoenix kind of forgot. When Danny is on the brain, nothing else matters. Quentin's appraisal of Daenerys is nice, but he did. And don't give me that Quentin is alive bullshit. What wrong with you? I say you, he did. But Quentin's two companions, Garrus Drinkwater and Archibald Yarnwood, are still alive. And what do Garrus Drinkwater and Archibald Yarnwood think about Daenerys? We know House Yarnwood are kind of rivals to House Martell, but Quentin and Arch were friends. When Barristan visits them in their cell after they get arrested for their plot to steal a dragon, we hear one of their opinions on the Dragon Queen. Quote, Sir Archibald, the big bald one, had nothing to say. He sat on the edge of his pallet, staring down at his bandaged hands in their linen wrappings. Sir Garrus punched a wall. I told him it was folly. I begged him to go home. Your bitch of a queen had no use for him. Any man could see that. He crossed the world to offer her his love and fealty, and she laughed in his face. She never laughed, said Selmy. If you knew her, you would know that. She spurned him. He offered her his heart and she threw it back at him and went off to fuck her sellsword, end quote. Uh-oh, that doesn't sound very good. This ain't it, chief. Also, I know it's Ironwood. I'm not Phoenix Ashes. I know how to read. Barristan and Quentin both say Danny never laughed, but she did. Quote, Prince Doran, he sank back onto one knee. Your Grace, I have the honor to be Quentin Martell, a Prince of Dorne, and your most leal subject. Danny laughed. The Dornish Prince flushed red, whilst her own court and counselors gave her puzzled looks. Radiance, said Skaha's shave pate in the Gascari tongue. Why do you laugh? They call him Frog, she said, and we have just learned why. In the Seven Kingdoms, there are children's tales of frogs who turn into enchanted princes when kissed by their true love. Smiling at the Dornish knights, she switched back to the common tongue. Tell me, Prince Quentin, are you enchanted? End quote. Daenerys did, in fact, laugh. Now, one could crouch and say, Danny didn't laugh at Quentin, just the story of his name. Daenerys and the shave pate were speaking in Giscari. Only people who speak in Giscari would know what they were talking about. And Quentin doesn't speak Giscari. If Kedri, Quentin's maester, was there, he could have explained why Danny laughed. Kedri was meant to serve as Quentin's counselor, but Kedri at the time was dead as hell, a condition he and Quentin now have in common. Quentin and Barristan are unreliable because we know Danny laughed regardless of the reason. Barristan and Garrus are unreliable because of their biases. Barristan is defending his queen. Garrus is defending the memory of his prince. Garrus is right in that Danny did laugh, but he's wrong that Danny spurred Quentin and threw his heart back at him. Danny had already had plans to marry his Darzo Lorak as part of her plan to establish peace in Marine, and Quentin didn't offer her his heart. He offered her Dorn. He came for fire and blood, not for love. Danny couldn't abandon her arrangement with his Dar. Remember the last time someone abandoned a marriage proposal? Welcome to the kill count. Ask Barristan and Garrus to write an account of what happened in the throne room that day and their stories would be wildly different. It would be Rashomon. Having Danny speak in Giscari means Garrus doesn't know why she laughed at Quentin. This misunderstanding is meant to serve as the reason for why Garrus doesn't like Daenerys. 
it seems there will be a lot of misunderstandings which will lead to the Dornish not liking Daenerys. For example, Quentin went to Marine and was killed by a dragon. Did Danny do that? No. But what if people think she did? It seems Daenerys develops a negative reputation wherever she goes. Remember in Karth after she burnt the House of the Undying? The Karthine were once very fond of Danny, but after that unpleasant incident, they quickly remembered dragons are dangerous and wanted her gone. The people adored Danny when she first wrote into the city. Public opinion is much different as she is on her way out. Danny notices this as she makes her way through the city. Quote, Pale men in dusty linen skirts stood beneath arched doorways to watch them pass. They know who I am, and they do not love me. Danny could tell from the way they looked at her. End quote. That sounds oddly familiar. I don't have love here. I only have fear. And everywhere the dragons danced, the people died. Anyway, Garrus is also right. Danny did go fuck <laughs> sellsword. She does do that a few times. What do you mean? Dario had her every way a man can have a woman, and she gave herself to him willingly. So wait, he's bending them? Girl. The roadie groans, so she's a... <clears throat> he sucked in her... Is it in his mouth? What is also pretty interesting is that actually not a single example of her supposed unreliability is given. Opie asks, who is the most unreliable narrator? The most aborted answer is Daenerys, and they claim that she could interpret things wrongly, but not an actual argument on what it could be, or an example of her wrongly interpreting things. Phoenix Ashes wouldn't care if one example was given, because I have given them an example of Daenerys being an unreliable narrator in the video I did way back when. Here, I'll show you. All the viewpoint characters are unreliable. Even, hold on, hang on. Watch this, it's going to be really funny. Quote, You speak of sacking cities. Answer me this, sir. Why have the Dothraki never sacked this city? She pointed. Look at the walls. You can see where they have begun to crumble. There and there. Do you see any guards on those towers? I don't. Are they hiding, sir? End quote. Now Danny has just pointed out that Astapor has crumbling walls. But that is in book three before she sacks the city. Then, in Book 5, when she hears of the political turmoil in Astapor, when she hears that young Kai sellswords have attacked the city, she says this, quote, Has the city fallen then? Its walls were thick. That is so, said the bricklayer, a stooped back man with roomy eyes, but they were old and crumbling as well. End quote. But is this Danny misremembering, or is this her lying to herself because she can't face reality? Either way, the source is unreliable. Even if you believe this is Daenerys simply misremembering something, that still makes her an unreliable narrator. This is the same as Sansa misremembering Joffrey's sword. Phoenix Ashes uses the So Spake Martin post twice to prove that Sansa misremembering this sword is deeply important, even though we know and they know it was Arya. And that was just a sword. Daenerys either misremembers the state of a city's walls, or she is deliberately lying to herself and survivors of war because the truth is too difficult to bear. If she is lying or wrong, that is hugely important. Do you think Phoenix Ashes mentions this in their video on Daenerys and unreliable narrators? No. Nope. This is why you can't trust Phoenix Ashes to accurately assess the material. They are a liar. Okay, so the line about the crumbling walls happens in a Daenerys chapter when a cobbler, a brickmaker, and a weaver arrive in Marine after escaping Astapor. At this point, Yunkai has attacked the city at Astapor, not Marine. Now we can blame the slavers for the current fate of the freedmen. What the Yunkish forces do is basically kill the fake Unsullied, kill any remaining fighters, and shut the survivors in the city to die. Because the city was already festering with disease and was on fire. Astapor was burning. She was burning. The survivors tell Danny about the horrors of the city. Quote, Soon after came the sickness, a bloody flux that killed three men of every four until a mob of dying men went mad and slew the guards on the gate. The old brickmaker broke in to say, No, 
That was the work of healthy men running to escape the flux. Does it matter? Asked the cobbler. The guards were torn apart and the gates thrown open. The legions of New Gis came pouring into Astapor, followed by the Yunkai and the sellswords on their horses. Queen Hor died fighting them with a curse upon her lips. King Cutthroat yielded and was thrown into a fighting pit to be torn apart by a pack of starving dogs. End quote. The brickmaker and the cobbler bicker briefly over the specific details of the city's demise. Which one of them is correct? We can never know. It's not necessary to know, but it is an interesting use of the unreliable narrator. We know from Quentin that the city was a living nightmare. That much of their story is true. This is what Daenerys tells the trio after they have told their story. Quote, It is good you have come, she told the Astapori. You will be safe in Marine. The cobbler thanked her for that, and the old brickmaker kissed her foot, but the weaver looked at her with eyes as hard as slate. She knows I lie, the queen thought. She knows I cannot keep them safe. As the poor is burning, and Marine is next. End quote. Daenerys lies to the trio. They were comforting lies, though, and she thought them kindly meant. A lie is not so bad if it is kindly meant. Right? The cobbler and the brickmaker will shelter in the city thinking they are safe. Only the weaver realizes the truth. This is Danny being unreliable. We are in her head. We know from her own thoughts she's lying. And she knows she's lying. The weaver knows she's lying. How did Phoenix Ashes miss that? Functional illiteracy. No, I'm sorry. Leaving out the part about the crumbling walls passes the pale of functional illiteracy. Once again, I think we have a moment of deliberate dishonesty, which is not surprising because Phoenix Ashes is a liar. I showed Phoenix Ashes this passage. They know it exists. They did three hours worth of bloody damn content reacting to my video. Phoenix is once again deliberately leaving out information they know exists because it doesn't fit their agenda. Phoenix Ashes is doing exactly what they accused another creator of doing. Twisting the text to fit whatever you want it to be while lying to your audience. Every accusation is a confession. Nothing else. This is the argument we have heard before on this channel, in particular during a certain unpleasant incident. That we only see Donna's unreliable perception of herself, that the truth about her may be different than what she shows us, that we don't know what it's like to experience the nurse's kindness. Yup, that's my quote. There are no associ POV characters. That's what I meant. We are not in the heads of the people Daenerys' decisions directly affect. And I don't mean Quentin and Sir Barristan. She is not radically changing their world. But the thing is, I don't even believe in the alternate reality Danny theory or whatever one might call it. Phoenix Ashes just thinks I do because they lump all critics of Daenerys into the same bubble. Quoting me serves no purpose because I don't even believe Danny is seeing things wrong. So now why am I in it? And you could have did it. See? No, I, I did it because you never I apologized. Did it. Back to business. We have no lowborn POVs in Essos or Westeros. The closest we have to a lowborn character point of view is Sir Davos Seaworth, and he has since been elevated from smuggler to landed knight to lord and hand of the king. That was my point when I said we are not on the receiving end of Danny's kindness. But Phoenix Ashes decided to throw shade at me in this terrible video where they argue with a nine-year-old Reddit post when we actually agree on something. Danny isn't living in her own personal matrix. You should have left me out of this. I don't even believe in this. Except we have characters in this story who do have unreliable perceptions of themselves. Theon before his captivity, and, most crucially perhaps, Cersei Lannister. We are able to contrast Cersei's thoughts with her actions and its effects. Danny is not shown being delusional about herself once. Danny is not shown being delusional of herself once. I don't even... The trees, they died for nothing. In Book 5, when the Pale Mare arrives in Marine and a horde of free people outside of Danny's gates become infected, she rides out to meet them. Quote, Sir Barristan wrinkled up his nose and said, Your Grace, you should not be here, breathing these black humors. I am blood of the dragon, Danny reminded him. Have you ever seen a dragon with a flux? 
Viserys had oft claimed the Targaryens were untroubled by the pestilences that afflicted common men, and so far as she could tell, it was true. She could remember being cold and hungry and afraid, but never sick. End quote. Later on, in the very same novel, Danny spends her final chapter shitting her brains out on the Dothraki Sea because, yes, Targaryens can get sick. Several of her Targaryen relatives died of illnesses. There are times when Daenerys is wrong. Daenerys is delusional. Daenerys is unreliable. Does this get brought up in Phoenix Ash's video? No. Danny is actually incredibly self-critical and always questioning whether she's doing the right thing. You mean like every POV character in these books. Every POV character is self-critical and questioning if they're doing the right thing. Sometimes it's a question of what's morally right. Other times it's a question of whether what they're doing is right for themselves. We are in these characters' heads. We are privy to all of their wants, worries, wonders, and woes. Their regrets, their shame, their pride. Everyone is constantly analyzing their own actions. Danny Stans proclaim her for being the POV character that cares most about the small folk. They forget that she's the only monarch that's a POV. Of course she's going to think a lot about the people. She's a ruler. Ned also thought a lot about protecting innocent lives. So does Davos. I think when people say she's very critical of herself, they admire the specific fact that she feels for her people. She has a strong desire to protect them and nurture them. This is admirable because it seems a lot of nobles don't share the same sentiment for their small folk. It's a great quality, but if we're saying Danny is objectively a good ruler because she feels for her people, she's not like Tywin Lannister, then the bar is in hell just like Tywin Lannister. One thing I think Martin is doing with Danny is showing us that just because a ruler loves their people, that doesn't mean they are good at ruling. You can be kind and benevolent and still mess up when it comes to statecraft. Countries don't run on good vibes only. There's a profound naivety among Danny's supporters that strongly reminds me of Sansa Stark and how she viewed the world in book one before all the stuff happened but we are now in book five and these people still think this way. On the subject of Danny and her conscience, here are some moments when Danny feels bad about something she's done and people like Phoenix don't even care, like after executing the 163 masters. Clearly, this is Danny trying to convince herself what she did was right. She has a sense that something about her actions was wrong. Instead of taking this moment and trying to figure out why Daenerys might feel bad about killing bad people, Danny stands just say this. I'm gonna be real with you. I don't give a single flying fuck as to whether some people in the 163 were just innocent slavers. They got what they deserve because, I don't know, they own human beings as property. And for that alone, they deserved punishment and suffering. They still profited immensely from slavery, no matter in how many pretzels you twist yourself. This is Danny feeling bad, but her feelings are being completely disregarded. And then, when the Unsullied are ordered to bring down the rotting bodies of the slavers, Danny does this, quote, Best bring sacks as well as shovels, worm, Brown Ben counseled. Well past ripe, those ones, falling off the poles in bits and pieces and crawling with, he, he knows, so do I. Danny remembered the horror she felt when she had seen the Plaza of Punishment in Astapor. I made a horror just as great, but surely they deserved it. Harsh justice is still justice. End quote. Surely they deserved it. If Phoenix Ashes actually cared about Danny's self-critical thinking, they would try to understand why she felt she was wrong. They don't. I wonder why that is. Functional illiteracy. This is why I say I don't think Danny Stans actually like her. They like the dragons and the silver hair and the purple eyes, especially Tumblr types like Phoenix, which is why Alexandria's Genesis took off there. They like that she wins a lot when everyone else in the story loses a lot, but they ignore huge aspects of her character. It's a disservice to the character, truly. The trees. Hitting pause real quick to let you all know a lot got edited out of this video. I addressed a lot of the lies Phoenix Ashes has told their audience about me. They run a toxic YouTube channel and all they do is spend their time in the comments section slinging insults at people. It's a Daenerys echo chamber, but I decided to leave that out of this video that might be another project. But for now, I want to talk about book three, Danny's first chapter. 
because she has yet another argument with Sir Jor, and she says something very strange. Quote, A queen must listen to all, she reminded him, the highborn and the low, the strong and the weak, the noble and the venal. One voice may speak you false, but in many there's always truth to be found. She had read that in a book. End quote. This is theoretical knowledge, not practical, because Danny learned it in a book. It's not something she learned by experience. This is a very naive thing for Daenerys to say, a would-be queen. It's also cringe. I think Martin wants us to side-eye Danny for making what sounds like a profound statement only for it to be followed up with. She had read that in a book. Daenerys knows the world doesn't work like this, but once again, she is arguing against the better judgment of Sajora Mormont. That's the context of this line. Phoenix Ashes left that out, of course. The next line is this, quote, Hear my voice then, your grace, the exile said. This Arsten Whitebeard is playing you false. He's too old to be a squire and too well-spoken to be serving that oath of a eunuch, end quote. And Arsten Whitebeard was playing her false. He's Sir Barristan Selmy. Before Daenerys gets to know him, she considers Barristan to be false for going over to the Usurper. Because of the biased redacted information she received from Viserys before he died, she thinks Barristan is someone who turned on their family. She was unreliable in that regard. That should have been brought up in this video on unreliable narrators. But it wasn't. It's great that Danny's opinion has changed when she was presented with conflicting information that challenged her view. And she didn't kill an innocent old man for doing his job. If only people in the real world could be as reasonable and accept corrections from old men. The reason why this talking point is used is twofold. First, because fans wholeheartedly believe that Daenerys is secretly evil, and it's hard to argue in favor of this when she's fighting against probably the most abhorrent institution imaginable and her enemies are, rightfully, comically evil. This is such a reductive way of speaking about the Mad Queen theory. Phoenix Ashes knows this. They know if they make the theory sound as ridiculous and unbelievable as possible, then others will be less likely to believe it. This is why I ignored their offer of a debate. I've never been in a debate or have taken a debate class, but I know when people are being disingenuous and dishonest, and Phoenix Ashes is an extremely disingenuous and dishonest person. Most believers of the theory believe Daenerys' story is about the road to hell being paved with good intentions. The theory isn't about an evil queen on the back of a dragon cackling madly as she says Dracarys over a city of innocent people. Danny's theorized downfall is almost always presented as a great tragedy. The general idea is that Daenerys is a good person that wants to do good things. She wants to help the helpless, defend the weak, and change harmful institutions to be less harmful. She wants people to have the freedom of choice in how they live their lives. She wants to save people. But she will come to realize that you can't save everyone. Wanting to do good does not mean your benevolent actions will automatically succeed. This will frustrate her to an extreme degree because a person can be bad at being good and Daenerys is bad at being good. She has great power to make great change, but that doesn't mean anything in and of itself. Martin himself has talked about this in an article from The Atlantic about Daenerys and her dragons, which is behind a paywall. God damn it. After paying the iron price, I have the full article and the quote. Here it is. Power is more subtle than that. You can have the power to destroy, but it doesn't give you the power to reform or improve or build. End quote. This is why Martin compares her dragons to nuclear deterrence. I've talked about this extensively in a video, Half-Life Harrenhal. Martin's quote is giving the game away. This is telling us how her story is going to end. Daenerys has the power to destroy, but she doesn't have the power to reform, improve, or build. Her efforts so far have shown us that. Phoenix Ashes claims Martin has never compared dragons with nukes. Someone had to tell Phoenix this article exists. This is just more proof Phoenix Ashes doesn't know what they're talking about. How can you make a whole video on dragons not being nuclear weapons and you don't know this quote. That means they didn't do any research at all. They made a video based on their own thoughts and vibes. And what did they say about another creator and their relationship with the canon? 
Because we live in an era where it does not matter what happens in the text, the only thing that matters is what you want it to be, the headcanon industrial complex. Additionally, Hills Alive not only misrepresents the text and twists it to fit into her preconceived notions, she also is straight up lying on several occasions. That sweet, delicious hypocrisy. And then they sit at their computer and claim other people don't know what they're talking about, slobbering all over their microphone, criticizing others. The audacity. Now, if I were a betting man, I would say this quote is not going to change their video. They say they're redoing the script, but I bet you the conclusion will be the same. They've already determined dragons aren't nuclear weapons or nuclear deterrents. They're going to shoehorn that quote into the video and keep on trucking. Everywhere Danny goes, she makes enemies with her rash decisions and her attempts to change things. And her ideas might come from a good place, but she's terrible at implementing them. She's bad at reform. It happened on the Dothraki Sea. It happened in Karth. It happened in Astapor. Now it's happening in Marine. Westeros will be no different. And everywhere the dragons danced, the people died. What could this mean? This is the Mad Queen theory, that Daenerys, with her immense power, will force her will on the world. She is the prime candidate for the stallion who mounts the world, after all. It starts in Essos and ends in Westeros. I prefer to call it the Tyrant Queen theory, but Mad Queen is more popular considering who her father is. It's not that she's secretly evil. This story isn't about good and evil. Hell, Martin has told us this isn't about good and evil as most fantasy authors would write it. Most readers understand that. It's just that Phoenix Ashes views the world through a binary lens. There's a deep irony in that. To Phoenix Ashes, you're either pro Danny or anti Danny. You're either a good person or a bad person. Being critical of Daenerys in any way places you in the anti Danny category. You are a bad person. Not all criticism is hate, but criticism can be interpreted as such from a person that is overly sensitive and lacks maturity from a person that has a lot of growing up to do. Instead of taking criticism of Daenerys as a personal attack, perhaps step back and remember, Danny isn't real. This is literary criticism. We're out here doing video essays on fictional characters. Danny isn't real, but the person making the criticism is. Only one person can be hurt if you decide to respond to the criticism of a fictional character with personal insults. I'm gentle parenting. God. It's not inherently hateful to believe a character in a fictional story is going to have a villainous future. It's that simple. Some of us believe Danny has tried to compromise with her enemies, but that didn't work. She's going to swing from compromise to no compromise. Why should she compromise when she has dragons? I know, I know. They're slavers. They deserve to die. Are you a slave apologist? She can kill all the bloody damn slavers she likes, but that doesn't solve slavery. And her mentality isn't going to magically switch up when she comes to Westeros. You can't kill thousands without it changing you. When the nobles there start to defy her the same way the slavers did, she'll use the only problem-solving tool she has, her dragons. If your only tool is a hammer, then every problem looks like a nail. She won't always be in Slaver's Bay, and there is nuance in Slaver's Bay for those paying attention. It's not simply kill all slavers. This sounds like slave apologia. Ugh. For example, the slavers fight with slave armies. Many of those slaves, I'm guessing, don't want to be there. And if Daenerys does wholesale destruction, then what will the former slaves have once all the masters are burned and dead and their buildings reduce to the ash? People go as far as to say that she's not even backed by the slaves, who prefer to be slaves, even though the slaves are actually willing to die and go through chaos and suffering to be freed. Ooh, First of all, where in the text does it say the majority of slaves are willing to go through chaos and suffering to be freed? We would need to see POV characters among the slaves, preferably the POV of a slave, to know that. Phoenix Ashes just made shit up. Citation? Example? No? 
So yeah, she does it again. She knows that her audience already believes what she believes and as such feels no need to convince anyone. I will count it as a lie then. Phoenix tells us we know how the majority of slaves feel about Danny, but Astapor is dead, Young Kai re-enslaved, and Marine is in turmoil. We do know how one former slave feels about Danny. Lord Gale once again comes to court begging for military assistance in Astapor. Once again, Daenerys denies him. Quote, Many of my freedmen were slaves in Astapor. Perhaps some of them wished to help defend your king. That is their choice. As free men, I gave Astapor its freedom. It is up to you to defend it. We are all dead then. You gave us death, not freedom. Gale leapt to his feet and spat in her face. Strong Belwas seized him by the shoulder and slammed him down onto the marble so hard that Danny heard Gale's teeth crack. The shave pate would have done worse, but she stopped him. End quote. I gave Astapor its freedom. It's up to you to defend it. The city with the crumbling walls she just sacked. Is this mentioned in Phoenix's video? No. Nope. We have the word of one former slave, the widow of the waterfront, who hints to Tyrion and Ser Jorah a slave rebellion is brewing in Volantis. In this video on unreliable narrators, Phoenix Ashes takes the word of this one woman as gospel. This is their evidence the slaves are ready to die and go through suffering to be free and serve Danny's cause. I do not doubt slaves in Volantis are looking to Marine and are plotting their own freedom. But I do have questions regarding the nature and extent of this possible rebellion. Phoenix just runs with it because it's a possible point in Danny's favor. The last time slaves rose up when Danny broke their chains, some heinous acts were committed. We hear of one such incident when Danny holds court in her first chapter in Book 5. Quote, a boy came, younger than Danny, slight and scarred, dressed up in a frayed gray tokar, trailing silver fringe. His voice broke when he told how two of his father's household slaves had risen up the night the gate broke. One had slain his father, the other his elder brother. Both had raped his mother before killing her as well. The boy had escaped with no more than the scar upon his face, but one of the murderers was still living in his father's house, and the other had joined the queen's soldiers as one of the mother's men. He wanted them both hanged. End quote. Danny is served by a racist. The passage goes on to say, quote, I am queen over a city built on dust and death. Danny had no choice but to deny him. She had declared a blanket pardon for all crimes committed during the sack, nor would she punish slaves for rising up against their masters. End quote. All crimes were legal during the sack, the purge marine. It was only after the sacking of marine that Danny punished murder, theft, and rape. How would Phoenix Ashes feel if this happened in Volantis? We already know. They told us there is no nuance in situations involving slavery. Hence, unreliable narrator is the only possible excuse they could use in this instance. To make it seem like Danny warps reality so much that there is actually nuance to the situation in Slaver's Bay. We heard what Phoenix Ashes said about the slavers. They deserve pain and suffering. It's just that pain and suffering can take many forms. And I am sure the mother of that boy, in her final moments, she endured a lot of pain and suffering. She was and murdered. This is what Phoenix Ashes condones when they say the slavers deserve pain and suffering. My point isn't that slave rebellions are bad. My point is that it is too soon to take the widow of the waterfront as an ally, exercise some caution because we do not know her or the type of rebellion being planned. She is unreliable in that regard. Danny can have dangerous friends, and it wouldn't be the first time she was betrayed by a matronly, motherly figure. What are the widow's bodyguards called? That's right, her sons. I'm not saying the widow is the harpy. Possible parallels is what I mean. Proceed with caution. Don't just go, look, look, see, Danny has friends in Volantis. Anyway, I also find it incredibly convenient that 99% of the slaves are ready to give their lives for her cause, that is, according to Phoenix. So if lots of them do die in the fight, it is because, hey, they wanted to die. They were okay with it. 
We can't judge Danny for that. The slaves were willing to endure the chaos and suffering she initiated. Danny shouldn't face any criticism. The Targaryens did nothing wrong. Phoenix Ashes might be confusing all the slaves in Volantis with the Red Priest in Volantis, but Nero speaks of Danny being Azor Ahai Reborn and how it is crucial that all people support her cause. Quote, but Nero has sent forth the word from Volantis. Her coming is the fulfillment of an ancient prophecy. From smoke and salt was she born to make the world anew. She is Azor Ahai returned, and her triumph over darkness will bring a summer that will never end. Death itself will bend its knee, and all those who die fighting in her cause shall be reborn. End quote. A holy war, a Masonic figure, a priest promising salvation if you die in service of their cause. Uh-oh, someone go get the flavor aid. I know how this ends. Second, because with the current trajectory of Dana's storyline, it is absolutely impossible for the preferred Mad Queen turn to happen. It is impossible for Danny to become the Mad Queen. And everywhere the dragons danced, the people died. That sign can't stop me because I can't read. Let's go over some of the things being said about Daenerys to determine the reliability of the claims. This is a video about unreliable narrators after all. First, what Quentin Martell heard that made him fear Daenerys. If we look at both quotes, they should be on screen right now or I fucked up editing. Some claims are being repeated by different people in different locations. Quentin hears about these rumors on a ship with the wind blown. Tyrion hears the rumors about Danny in Volantis. Phoenix calls this propaganda, and that may be so, but one thing they completely don't understand is that sometimes propaganda works. Take, for example, the doctrine of exceptionalism, a precept that stated the Targaryens were of the blood of old Valyria and not like other men. Therefore, they could not be judged for practicing incest. Westerosi religions did not apply to them because they were not Westerosi. Propaganda that worked. Their family tree could look like a braid, but they were allowed to do that. If Quentin and Tyrion are hearing similar rumors in two different places on the globe, the propaganda about Daenerys is working. Daenerys is already dealing with some of the fallout from these rumors about her. Hisdar and her talk about these rumors in dance when she suggests making a peace with Yunkai. Quote, there is the thorn in the bower, my queen, said Hisdar Zolorak. Sad to say, Yunkai has no faith in your promises. They keep plucking the same string on the harp about some envoy that your dragons set on fire. Only his tokar was burned, said Danny scornfully. Be that as it may, they do not trust you. The men of Nugis feel the same. Words are wind, as you yourself have oft said. No words of yours will secure this peace for Marine. Your foes require deeds. They would see us wed, and they would see me crowned as king to rule beside you. End quote. Danny did that. She Dracarist and invoice Tokar. He shit himself in response and complains that Danny failed to provide him safe conduct. This is true. Setting an envoy on fire is not safe conduct. It's also not a good look. Envoys are supposed to be seen as non-targets or else how can communication between two parties be carried out? Don't shoot the messenger. It is considered unbecoming behavior to harm a person's invoice. Ask Aegon the Conqueror. Ask Chinggis Khan. Daenerys has no one to blame for burning that Tokar. Now Yunkai isn't answering her calls. As for the other rumors, the propaganda is propaganding. It's not all propaganda, by the way. Some of it is just misinformation passed across the globe in a game of telephone. Ariane Martel and Damon Sand discuss the rumor Danny was complicit in her brother's murder. Quote, the secret pact that Prince Doran had made all those years called for Ariane to be wed to Prince Viserys, not Quentin to Daenerys. It had all come undone on the Dothraki Sea when he was murdered, crowned with a pot of molten gold. He was killed by a Dothraki call, said Ariane, the Dragon Queen's own husband. So I've heard. What of it? Just, why did Daenerys let it happen? Viserys was her brother, all that remained of her own blood. The Dothraki are savage folk. Who can know why they kill? Perhaps Viserys wiped his arse with the wrong hand. End quote. 
We know the truth of what happened that night Viserys was crowned in molten gold. The characters do not. The information they have access to is extremely limited. The information they hear can be unreliable. They can be unreliable. Let's say, for example, the news of Quentin's death reaches Westeros before Garrus and Arch do. Aryan Martell already believes Daenerys let Drogo kill Viserys. Now she will learn her brother died by dragons after going to propose to the Dragon Queen. What will Aryan do then? It seems sort of obvious. We know a second dance is coming. The reasons for the war are being laid out right now. In their video on unreliable narrators, does Phoenix talk about the possibility of the rumors, the misinformation, the propaganda working against Danny? No. Thus far, practically everything Danny did was good or in the service of good. Destruction of slavery. Daenerys didn't destroy slavery. She killed a bunch of slave masters in two different cities. Then, when she sat in a pyramid in a position of power, she allowed people to sell themselves into slavery. Daenerys can't end slavery. We, we still have slavery in our real world. Remember when Phoenix said, I belong in jail? Daenerys Targaryen is going to end worldwide slavery in her lifetime. She's going to ensure stability in each region before leaving. She's going to come to Westeros, fight the others, reunite the Seven Kingdoms, and complete Targaryen restoration in the span of two books. And then she's going to rebuild the dragon pit and create a dragon breeding program. Sure, Jan. We're coming to the end of this video, and this is when things get stranger than they already have been. Part 7. The Bobby B. Bot Robert Baratheon is considered this great guy, amazing Bobby B, who is super based for beating his wife and wanting to kill a 14-year-old girl that he calls a whore. You called a girl a whore! 1. It's not the book version of Robert Baratheon that the fandom enjoys. It's the show version. The fandom likes Mark Addy. Bobby B is a meme. People having fun. Phoenix is such a miserable, mean-spirited person that it confuses them when people have fun. When people come together and have fun together. This is a post from their Tumblr, which is supposed to be sarcastic, but no, Phoenix Ashes, you do not know how to have fun. Your idea of fun is trashing people, harassing people, and running to the comment section of your videos to talk shit and insult people. Your idea of fun is hatred. Since you like adding titles, I dub thee a hater, a loser, and a bully. Put that in your profile. Titles, titles. Phoenix always resorts to pearl clutching and feigned moral outrage when making their arguments. It's insufferable. Phoenix likes to engage in what I call moral combat. To win their petty online arguments, they will try to make people out to be objectively bad people. Bobby B isn't funny. He's horrible. Stop laughing at the breastplate stretcher line. Hang on while I run to Martha Wayne's closet and grab those pearls. Fine. You want to play moral combat? Let's do this. Ned making Bran watch executions is definitely child abuse. He's a terrible father. He deserved to die. Anyone that defends Ned is a terrible person and should probably stay away from kids. Ned only took Theon to executions to intimidate him because ice is the sword Ned would use to kill Theon if he had to. It's psychological torment to make Theon be the one to bring him ice during executions. Ned is a monster. Rob brings his direwolf to battle. This is literal dogfighting. Is he the Westerosi Michael Vick? John recruits children to the Night's Watch for the promise of food and shelter. This is exploitation of the poor and he's creating an army of child soldiers. I can't believe he has fans. Jon Snow, more like John Coney, disappointing. Catelyn Stark betrothed her son and daughter to Freys. First of all, she did it without their consent, which is extremely problematic. Secondly, Arya is a child. Catelyn wants to make her daughter a child bride. It's good she died. All right, enough. Liking Bobby B or Vizzy T is not an endorsement of their behavior. As a character in a fictional story, I would argue one of his purposes is to entertain. Some people find his antics entertaining. Some people find Darth Vader entertaining. People like Darth Vader. They dress up as him. But I guess, hold on, moral combat. 
oh my god, Darth Vader participated in intergalactic genocide. He's a murderer. He assaulted his wife. He killed younglings. People that like Darth Vader must hate women and children. I cannot imagine being this insufferable, being upset with people for liking the Bobby B bot. If you go on the subreddit and purposefully activate the Bobby B bot so it can say Darth Rocky on an open field, Ned, just so you can have a laugh, that is something I will not tolerate and I will say it to Snoo himself. The reason Phoenix Ashes is upset people find Bobby B entertaining is because they don't like people liking things they don't approve of. Evidence shown here when they told Harry Potter fans to end their own lives for liking Snape. It's also because he wanted to hurt Danny. That's all it really boils down to. He was an enemy of Danny. I don't know why this would make someone whine about a bot on a message board. It's a fucking joke. There are memes and jokes that masquerade as harmless fun. Meanwhile, they cover up actual hatred, bad ideas. The Bobby B bot isn't one of them. The video only continues with more of this petty behavior, Phoenix Ashes policing opinions and trying to paint those in the fandom as being morally or objectively wrong when the fandom has opinions they don't approve of. There's no point in me going over that, which means it's time to wrap this shit up. Part 8. Conclusion Now to close, Daenerys Targaryen has many moments of being an unreliable narrator. The fact that she wants to wage war on Westeros when she doesn't even know the truth about Robert's Rebellion is very concerning. She doesn't know the truth and what's worse is she has put off learning the truth. It may be she never learns the truth and sets sail for Westeros anyway. Daenerys rethinking what Viserys had told her about their father when confronted by Barristan and Selmy is a start, but it's not enough. She must learn the truth. Anything else is ignorance and you cannot start a war from a place of ignorance. Though it seems that some readers that support her believe she will learn the truth and she will be better for it. These people argue in defense of Daenerys as if she has already learned the truth. For them, she has already done all the things she set out to do. So when people criticize her, they are confused or even enraged. She ended slavery. She saved the world. She fixed Westeros. How can people hate her when she's done so much good? Thus far, practically everything Danny did was good or in the service of good. Destruction of slavery. See, Daenerys destroyed slavery when there is still slavery. Part 9. The Ashes. I don't like Phoenix Ashes content. I find their videos to be too pedantic and too mean-spirited. It seems what inspires them to make content isn't a genuine love for the books, but a hatred for others. And it's not just enough for them to share their thoughts in their own private spaces. There's always a need to lash out at other people. It seems to be a compulsion in them. Just look at the title of the video under discussion now. It wasn't enough to just state the video was about unreliable narrators. They had to attack other people. A misanthropic, poisonous hatred that masquerades itself as moral righteousness permeates their content. But you'd think someone like me would like that, right? Because in the beginning, I said I'm a messy bitch that lives for drama, and Phoenix is all about the drama. Except that was a meme. That was a joke. That's a Joanne the Scammer meme. Even still, I don't find that drama entertaining. It's exhausting because it's not drama. It's just toxicity. Think of it as the difference between Joffrey and Ramsay. Joffrey was evil, but entertaining. Drama. Ramsay is just evil. Toxic. You don't want to see what insane things he might say or do next. At least, I hope not. The thumbnail of Phoenix's original video told me all I needed to know. I knew from the jump how Danny defenders get down. I've seen this happen on other social media platforms. People get bashed and bullied by Daenerys Targaryen supporters for criticizing Daenerys. It's happened to me on more than one occasion. I didn't have to watch the call out video on Hills to know what was up. But I wonder, did Phoenix Ashes offer Hills a chance for a debate? I'm guessing not. They jumped straight to trashing. The video wasn't criticism, it was just trashing. When trashing is just abuse dressed up as valid criticism. I will use a ContraPoints clip where she explains the difference. It is not disagreement, it is not conflict, it is not opposition. These are perfectly ordinary phenomena which, when engaged in mutually, honestly, and not excessively, are necessary to keep an organism or organization healthy and active. 
Trashing is a particularly vicious form of character assassination which amounts to psychological rape. It is manipulative, dishonest, and excessive. It is occasionally disguised by the rhetoric of honest conflict, or covered up by denying that any disapproval exists at all. But it is not done to expose disagreements or resolve differences. It is done to disparage and destroy. Whatever methods are used, trashing involves a violation of one's integrity, a declaration of one's worthlessness, and an impugning of one's motives. In effect, what is attacked is not one's actions or one's ideas, but one's self. And that's what distinguishes trashing, bullying, or abuse from criticism or holding accountable. Criticism attacks your actions or beliefs. Trashing amounts to psychological rape. Per Phoenix Ash's multiple messages, they were not going to stop demanding a debate. My silence was not taken for a no. They were going to keep forcing themselves on me. Trashing involves a violation of one's integrity. Hills Alive has no idea what she's talking about and is lying all the time. A declaration of one's worthlessness. While previously I was at worst ironic, here I intend to be as bitchy as physically possible. And I will start talking to Hills Alive directly in the second person singular, since we reached a point where she no longer deserves respect or cuddling. Kevin Pendragon belongs in jail. This guy is dumb. It is done to disparage and destroy. When the sun sets, your grift shall end. Did it though? None of this is legit criticism. It's just the abuse of cancel culture. This might all sound overly dramatic, but that is what's happening here. Phoenix Ashes wanted to get a hate train going. Hills Alive was doing damage in the community and had to be stopped. Here is a Tumblr post where they suggest people should share their video anytime Hills Alive's content is mentioned. Spam their video, spread the word, then people will see the truth. Then people will stop watching Hills and turn to Phoenix Ashes. They want the audience Hills has. Phoenix is not just a hypocrite, they're also a hater. Phoenix wanted to take down Hills. This was meant to be the expose of the century. But Phoenix never considered what if their attempt didn't work? How would they be viewed by the community at large? Because it didn't work. Their epic takedown failed. Look at that like to dislike ratio. Disappointing. All they managed to do was attract a bunch of people that already didn't like Hills Alive. These people just needed a central place to vent their frustrations and Phoenix Ash's channel became that place. And I know those numbers bother them. The comments are more favorable, which is why you can find Phoenix Ashes in them, even now replying constantly. This is a chronically online individual. They need that validation. Phoenix Ashes often tries to paint their detractors as awful, vile, horrible people, but their behavior is nothing but disgusting, vile, and horrible. Again, every accusation is a confession. For those keeping record, I only treated them the way they treated Hills. I used their words against them. Functional illiteracy. And I bet it doesn't feel good when people call you out, especially when you know there's truth in their words, no matter how hard you try to put on a front. Which is why they overreacted and made three hours of video in response to my original video. These three videos are longer than the video they did defending their favorite character. The excess was out of embarrassment. They rushed to make three long videos because they needed the immediate comfort of a comment section telling them, you're right and everyone else is wrong, don't worry about it, so they could feel better about themselves. They needed that reassurance from their audience because they don't have any real friends to turn to. If you're subscribed to them, fair warning, this person will one day treat you like an enemy too. They make enemies everywhere they go. You're next. It's only a matter of when, not if. They have already attacked their audience before. The comment has since been deleted because Phoenix Ashes likes to hide their hand. But notice, they attacked someone that was on their side because they weren't paying attention. They were just lashing out, mad. Like I said, you're next. I can't imagine why anyone would want to stay subbed knowing how dishonest they are. Now, I'm not asking Phoenix to apologize to anyone. And as a rational person, I understand they lack maturity. I think any reasonable person has already come to that conclusion. Another thing immature people do when called out is double down on their bull****.
did. Hence, Phoenix Ashes repeating the So Spick Martin entry without correcting it. Hence, telling someone to call the police when they pointed out what they were doing was committing the act of harassment. Hence, when a teenager told them what they were doing was cyberbullying, when they suggested they die by side, they kept doing it. This tells me if I did debate Phoenix Ashes as they demanded, I would be wasting my time. There's nothing here but bile, bullshit, and bigotry. What do I mean by bigotry? Well, I think it's very telling that all of the people that Phoenix Ashes has attacked, myself excluded, are young women or girls. And here is them calling Liana Stark a bitch to make a point. Here is them responding to a question where someone calls Allison Hightower a la c They have said they don't care about Sansa Stark or Allison Hightower and their suffering because those characters don't challenge gender roles. Their biggest video is one trashing a female YouTuber. They consistently trash Sansa Stark, a female character. At the beginning of A Game of Thrones, she's an airheaded idiot. When you think of an airhead, do you think of a man or a woman? Do you think of Jason Mendoza from The Good Place? Hasanabi? No, those are himbos. You don't think of boys when you hear the insult airhead. You think of girls. They call Sansa a dumb bird, which is an insult I've only heard used toward women. They call Sansa a dumb bird, but they're a phoenix that can't f***ing read. Phoenix harasses the people that defend the women of Team Green on Tumblr. They told a lesbian to kill and called her a yapping chihuahua. If a lesbian were a dog, they'd be a female dog, also known as a... Get out, you hateful bitch! So, Virgil, I gather you like hitting ladies. Uh, some ladies need to get hit. Uh-huh, then conversely... Oh. Oh. Let me guess, it was Phoenix Ash's moral responsibility to tell this person to kill us because there's always an excuse. Or let me guess, this happened so long ago and they're a changed person. This shit happened in September 2022. Again, we were halfway through House of the Dragon season one when they were out here acting like this. Then four months later, Phoenix got on here to point the finger at someone else. I truly can't get over the fact that Phoenix was telling people to kill then turned around and accused someone else of being a bully. The sheer audacity, thinking they could get away with it. All the people Phoenix said should kill themselves are girls. They promote the problematic, misogynistic idea of Stockholm Syndrome. And she remains that slave up until the moment Drogo dies. Any power she possesses is also being granted to her graciously by her pedophile rapist husband. She never stops being a slave, she never stops thinking of herself as being sold, even after her Stockholm Syndrome causes her to fall in love with Drago. They bemoan sexism and misogyny while actually being incredibly sexist and misogynistic themselves. Phoenix is just like Cersei Lannister. Both hate Sansa, both are unhinged, both hate women in general. Like Cersei, this person has nothing to say unless they have something to hate. Now, this might sound like the height of corniness, but I'd rather listen to people who talk about this series out of love than out of hate. There are so many A Song of Ice and Fire creators on this platform. There seems to be a spirit of collaboration among us. Phoenix Ashes might be the first and only creator that made their entrance with a fuck you to another creator. They did the opposite of collaborating. All Phoenix Ashes does is hate and hate watch. They supervise other people's content. They watch your subscriber count. They wonder at your Patreon. They take notes of how many upvotes a post on Reddit has from nine years ago. They pretend these are things they don't really care about, but they do. They care deeply. They watch and they judge and they hate. They hate that other people are actually in this for the fun of it, while all they have is hate. They don't like George, they don't like the fandom, and they don't actually like the series. All they like is Daenerys Targaryen. They don't like Tumblr while being on Tumblr. They don't like TikTok. Oh wait, they're on TikTok now. They hated Twitter. They wanted to stop making videos. Oh wait, they're going to keep making videos. Why? Because they can't stop posting. Because there was a woman that needed to be bashed. Everywhere they go, they are miserable. Some advice from an old man, if everywhere you go, there's a problem, you're the fucking problem.
They will pretend to be morally superior to everyone else, yet they have no actual morals. They think George himself is a racist misogynist, but they still discuss his work. They promote his material while thinking he is objectively a bad person. Phoenix Ashes is willing to ignore what they believe to be blatant racism and misogyny just so they can enjoy their favorite character, Daenerys Targaryen. Racism doesn't affect Phoenix, so they can just ignore it in places where they believe it exists. I wonder why. We're black in Poland. Of course you get called slurs at the Christmas market. Yikes! Instead of screaming that Hills Alive might be the descendant of black slave owners, you might want to work on the race relations in your own country. Cause this ain't it, chief. The house is indeed made of mirish glass. While being a white American, who may as well descend from actual owners of black slaves, and I made excuses for you then. Now I know exactly why I got three videos trashing me and Hills only got one. Let's be real. If you thought Martin was an actual racist, the morally right thing to do would be to boycott the books. This isn't an HP Lovecraft situation. But Phoenix clearly isn't boycotting. However, they will clutch their pearls and point at people who aren't boycotting in other situations. The audacity to complain that people can't stop eating at Chick-fil-A when you can't stop talking about a series of books that you don't even like. You can't boycott either. Every accusation is a confession. At least people have to eat food. You don't have to read these books and make these terrible videos. Phoenix is morally superior than everyone else because they won't eat a homophobic chicken sandwich, but they will support a racist misogynist though. This is because Phoenix Ashes has no morals or values. They only pretend to have morals and values so they can attack other people. I wonder what else is going on in Poland. We're black in Poland. Of course they check under my headscarf for a bomb. <laughs> I'm black in Poland. Of course I get DMs asking me, how big is it? Disappointing. They won't stop talking about the books because they don't actually care about racism and misogyny. These are merely topics they weaponize for their petty online feuds. They don't care about anything but Danny. And even then, it's their idea of Danny, not who she actually is. And because they have no morals, no values, only hate, they assume the same of everyone else. Everyone else is a bully. Everyone else is lying to their audience. Everyone else is grifting. Everyone else is bad. Meanwhile, Phoenix Ashes is the only one upholding the text and the law, while the rest of us are flouting our do as you please. They are always so aggrieved because everyone else is getting away with being wrong. So when they attack unprovoked, their malicious behavior is actually justified because their target deserved it. But it's Phoenix Ashes that's the bully. It's Phoenix Ashes that lies to their audience. It's Phoenix Ashes that misrepresents the text to fit whatever agenda they currently have. Exhausting, wasn't it? Hiding beneath that cloak of your own righteousness. But now they see you as you are. <laughs> Thank you to the following Patreon supporters and channel members, including Philip E. You can become one too for as little as $1 a month. Please like, subscribe, and leave a comment down below. Also, subscribe and ring that bell. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Phoenix Ashes, if you've listened this far, grow up. Let me get a bit personal here. I never had much of a parental instinct. As of now, I don't plan to have children. However, due to various circumstances of my life, my family history and other experiences that I had, I was convinced very early in my life that there is no love in this world stronger than that of a parent towards their children. And I can tell you with full certainty that if someone killed my child in my womb, I would not be half as merciful as Danny was. I would skin this motherfucker alive while pouring salt on each and every one of his wounds, and after he dies in the biggest possible agony, I would whack his corpse into pieces. An awkward silence followed. Have they all swallowed their tongues? Cersei thought, with irritation. It was enough to make her wonder why she bothered with the council. Stop it. Get some help.